Dr. Lee and Crystal is now from the Catholic Church. We thought this was a wonderful, wonderful place to meet and even have this discussion. And by the way, that's the best deal that we've ever had with Catholics before. And so we want to thank the Pope for that, I guess. But it's a wonderful time. Uh, we believe in the kingdom. Brethren are studying. They're looking into their Bibles again. People have their interest peaked in last things. And we're so happy to have this discussion and this debate this weekend. We want to thank Drew Leonard coming up with his wife and his in-laws driving up from Missouri or Tennessee. And he is going to be one of the disputants in the discussion. Of course, Steve Bazden is going to be the other debater. And Steve will be arguing the case for the fulfillment of all things. He can read the proposition when he gets here. And he can tell us exactly what he is going to debate. Now, we encourage everyone, first of all, turn your cell phones off, please. All right? Robert will, for sure. And let's have, uh, be respectful to the debaters. We don't uh, want any over uh, demonstrations of approval or disapproval. Even amens, you can keep those to yourself, especially no clapping. And uh, we'll just let the debaters do the debating. Now there's going to be four 20-minute speeches given by each of the debaters this afternoon. Generally, in a four-night oral debate, we would have three speeches, but this is a three-day debate, and so we want to have just as much information into this afternoon's discussion and tomorrow and Saturday. So there'll be four 20-minute uh, speeches. Uh, we don't have this about Brother Steve Bazden, and I'm moderating for him. My name is Holger Neubauer. I am happy to be with Steve Bazden. He is one of the most faithful men I've ever met in my life. He has great, great interest and energy and uh, integrity in which he uh, puts forward for the kingdom of God. And I appreciate him so much, and I'm looking forward to this uh, discussion this afternoon. We're glad that the debaters are here. They've agreed to abide by Hedge's rule. They've read the, the uh, requirements, and that will be a, a good discussion. Let me say this thing first about the base, and we'll have a prayer by Brother Brent Bischel from. Uh, Bay Where's Brent? Where are you? Oh, there you are, Brent. Where are you in California? You're from Bakersfield? Where are you? Springville. Springville, California. All the way from California. And we think that. Uh, Brent's doing a great job there. He's recently come uh, to the truth on covenant eschatology, realized the uh, uh, teachings of Christ independently, by the way, as you were going to meet brethren all over the country who have independently come to this particular uh, view. So we appreciate them so very much. And just in a moment, Brent's going to come and lead us in opening prayer. And then we're going to turn the uh, microphone over to Brother Steve Bazin. For those of you that might be a bit squeamish about debating, those of you that perhaps it will be the first time that you actually hear a public oral debate, I want to say something about the nature of debating and the good. The greatest debater of all time, of course, was our Lord, Jesus. And Jesus, in confronting, in Mark chapter 12, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Herodians, and one by one, he refuted the best of their arguments. And he was pointed. He told the Sadducees, you do err, not knowing the Scriptures, nor the power of God. The Bible says in Mark 12, verse 37, and the common people heard him gladly. Now, as long as these speakers are going to abide well by the rules set forward, regardless of how hard they press their positions, or how strong they are in their convictions, it is the truth that will ultimately surface. The Hebrews believed in something called the pill pool, and that is through academic debate that ultimately the weak ideas would fall and the strong ideas would be victorious. That's what we believe. And so we believe that this will have uh, a good, good uh, outcome. We're so thankful for the good interest. Glad that Drew has come. He's willing to debate. And uh, I am 
She is so happy, I don't have to do the debate this time. And I just get to listen to this debate. And uh, I love Steve. He's a great man in the kingdom. And I have, I would rather have Steve Bates next to me going into a spiritual battle than any living man. I trust him with my life. I trust him so implicitly. And I know that he pulled the way through. And I love him, and I'm glad that I can introduce him today. So, Brother Brent, and by the way, great to meet you. I should have recognized who you were from Facebook, but I don't frequent Facebook like some of my Facebook friends over here. But Brent is a good man. We're glad to have him. Brent, come lead us in opening prayer, and then Steve will take over the debate. Thank you, Holden. Let's pray, folks. Father, as we, as we come before your throne this afternoon, we... we ask your richest blessing upon all of us who are here, upon the speakers and upon your word, Father, as we study it, uh, to, as we do so, that we we will be people of the book and it will encourage us to dig into your word more and more. We, we ask that as we leave this place that your traveling mercies would be upon us and that you would bless us to our habitations and then bring us back, Father, for the entire weekend. Father, we ask your blessing upon us as we go into this, and we thank, thank you so very much for your, your love and your uh, to allow us to be here and gather here and to look into your word, and we ask your blessing upon it. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 on this topic. This is a timely topic. It's an important topic. It's a topic that it seems like many, many, many people in the church worldwide are looking into this very thing at this very time. 
And so with those things being said, we're going to uh, treat each other with Christian decorum, with decency, and with love for the truth in our hearts. And let me say this, Drew. You prove me wrong, I'll stand up here this day, whenever that happens. I repent, brother, I'll get right. I have no animosity with you, or I, all I want is the truth. And I, I, let no man despise thy youth, I do not despise your youth. So I want you to know that right from the beginning. Uh, but that being said, let's go ahead and you can start the timer if you would, please. The uh, proposition is Jesus has returned. Let me, let me pull this up on a bigger screen here. Um, slide show. I'm not the most technologically savvy, but I can work through a few things. Jesus has returned the second time in the first century for the judgment and the right. Or I at least want to touch on this real quick. This is common language. Everybody here knows what we're talking about. I don't feel it necessary to go through and get a definition for every little particular syllable that's up here. But I do want to bring to your uh, understanding or your recognition right now is the definite articles, the the judgment, the resurrection. Because I do believe judgment is ongoing, and one of those things are eternal. So I want to bring that to your uh, recognition right out of the onset, uh, right from the beginning here. So getting into my argument, my first argument is this. Drew Leonard, are you married? We're going to go to Luke chapter 20 because this has been a favorite argument for many people. If you're married, they say, Jesus said, in the resurrection, they're neither married nor given in marriage. And if you claim resurrection is coming, you're in resurrection, basically you can't be married. Well, let's read the text and see what's going on here. Luke chapter 27, beginning, uh, Luke chapter 20, beginning verse 27. Then came to him certain of the Sadducees, which deny there is any resurrection. And they asked him, saying, Master, Moses wrote unto us, if any man's brother die having a wife, and he die without children, that his brother should take his wife and raise up seed after his brother. There were therefore seven brethren, and the first took his wife and died without children. The second took her wife, etc. Yeah, I think most of us are familiar with this story. But the first thing I want to bring to your attention is this. Moses wrote unto us about this particular marriage. This is not marriage in general for all the world. This is not even general Jewish marriage. This is a specific marriage that is spoken about to Jesus about a specific time and a specific event. It's talking about inheritance, and, excuse me, inheritance for Jews who would die before they could have any seed that would carry along their inheritance. This is a specific marriage law for the Jews that they're asking Jesus about, not talking about generic marriage law. You can read about that in Deuteronomy chapter 25. And as we go down in this text, I'm going, to, I'm going to elaborate on that a little bit more. Verse 34, Jesus, or verse 33, Therefore, in the resurrection, in the resurrection, whose wife of them is she? Verse 7, had her wife. Now this, again, this is talking about elaborate marriage laws. Not even regular Jewish marriage law, not Gentile marriage law. This is specifically elaborate Jewish marriage law so they could not lose their inheritance through their seed physically. This is the marriage under uh, contemplation here. We, or excuse me, I'm, uh, let's just keep looking at what the text So, In the resurrection, whose wife will she be? Jesus answered, verse 34, the sons of this age marry and are given in marriage, but those who are kind of worthy to attain that age and the resurrection from the dead, neither married nor are given to marriage. Neither can they die anymore, for they are equal to the angels and are children of God, being the children of the resurrection. This entire conversation deals with the law of Moses regarding the elaborate Jewish marriage law of Deuteronomy 25. This marriage is not for Gentiles. It is not regarding all marriages for all people. It is specifically dealing with elaborate marriage law for the Jews and how they would receive relation to God. The Sadducees believe they can only attain inheritance through physical relations. That's what they believe. But, that's what the Jews believe generally. But in the age to come, Christianity, inheritance comes through spiritual relations, which the Sadducees denied. Jesus said, you must be born again of the water and the Spirit, in John 3, 5. Nicodemus cannot be born again physically. It was not through that physical means that anyone could enter resurrection life. 
Jesus denied the physical, the, uh, the Sadducees' physical paradigm regarding the age to come. Drew has not stopped to contemplate that his own paradigm condemns him. He's not stopped to contemplate that. The text says, but they which shall be counted worthy to obtain that age and the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given a marriage. Drew's paradigm is this. Jesus is talking about the age of the physical planet, this age, this world. When this world ends, we enter into the spiritual world. There's an end to the physical planet. That's his argument. That's what he thinks. So, if you're married, you can't be in the world to come because the physical world's still here. But the paradigm comes back to haunt them and bite them because the Bible says they which are kind of worthy to obtain that world neither marry nor are given in marriage. If you're married now in the physical way, you can't get into resurrection life. You cannot enter that afterlife. That's the issue that you've got to deal with. If it's physical like he says in his book it is, and he's married now, he cannot attain resurrection life. Neither can he attain being the children or child of God. Drew cannot be married. If it is physical marriage regarding the physical world, then he is not worthy to obtain that world to come because he's married. If Drew's correct, if he wants salvation, when the physical world is... Or he can't get into that next world to come. He had better get a divorce. And I, he was just married two months ago. He's going to have to divorce his beautiful young bride. If he wants to attain that world to come, why? Because physical marriage has got him condemned now. Drew, are you married? If it is the physical world under consideration here, no one can be saved that is married. Elders? Can't be any elders. Oh, why? They're married. You can't get into that world to come. They, he condemns Paul. He condemns Christ. He condemns everything in the Bible that says marriage is good and honorable and all the bed undefiled. But he says, oh no, if you're married, you can't get into that spiritual world. I'm sorry, I'm going to get into that spiritual world. I have been, I am in that spiritual world, and it's not by physical means I was placed there. Christianity is based on spiritual relations, not physical relations. Drew, are you a male? Are you a man? In Galatians chapter 3, verses 27 and 28, the Apostle Paul will write, for as many of you as have been baptized into Jesus Christ, uh, have put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for we are all one in Christ Jesus. If you can't see the paradigm of not being a male while in the same time being in Christianity, that's why you can't see the paradigm. You're blinded by looking at only the physical aspect of things. And if you say that it's got to be this physical relationship, then you can't even be a male and a Christian at the same time. That's a major, major thing you're going to have to deal with. You see, you can still be a male and be a Christian at the same time because it is not the physical that determines the spiritual relationship. The same is true with marriage. You're not a Christian because you're married. Under that old law, you had to be married into that Jewish family. In the new law, you must be born again of the water and of the Spirit. Being married and given in marriage, if you think that is how it happens, you're not worthy to attain Christianity. Drew, according to Drew's dilemma, if the physical age has not ended and the resurrection has not come, marriage will continue. Drew needs to get a divorce. Jesus said in John chapter 11, I am the resurrection and the life. No man cometh unto the Father by, my, by me. He that lives and believes in me shall never die again. Believe thou this? Jesus said, I am in the resurrection. If you're in Christ, for as many as have been baptized into Christ to put on Christ, you're in the resurrection. But he says you can't attain it. Why? Because you're married. Well, why? Because I guess you're a man or a woman. You can't. Don't you know, Basin? There's a spiritual world here and, and, and a physical world there. And I believe we're the physical one. And, spirit, and if you're this, you can't be that. Oh, he's got that thing all backwards. He's got it all mixed up. I affirm the resurrection did come exactly when the scriptures say it would. And that faithful, physical marriage will not condemn anyone. Luke 20, 36. Neither can they die anymore, for they are equal unto the angels and are children of God, being children of the resurrection. Drew, are you a child of God? Jesus said in the resurrection they would need they would be uh, children of God. In the resurrection, there would be in fact he, he he placed those same things synonymously with each other. 
talking about that exact same paradigm. In John uh, chapter 11, verse 25, I am the resurrection. Excuse me, I am the resurrection, and whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die again. Believest thou this? It said 2,000 years ago of Jesus. You get in the resurrection, you have eternal life. And that's not physical eternal life. Otherwise, it would still be apostles walking around here alive physically. This is talking about spiritual life. The thing that he says is yet to come, I claim I now have it. I claim that the kingdom of God is a spiritual And he thinks it's yet in the future somehow. It says, Drew demands that no marriage, he must also deny being a child of God. He must deny having eternal life. He now must also, uh, he must deny being in Jesus, the resurrection. These are all used collectively regarding the same age. Jesus said being in resurrection is equal to being a child of God. The they which shall be counted worthy to obtain that age, children of God, in resurrection, have an eternal life, and the resurrection from the dead, neither married nor given a marriage. In Drew's book, page 36, he demands that the age where there are children of God has not yet come. We, quote, are still anticipating the age to come, unquote, regarding Luke 20, verses 34 to 30. Romans 6, verses 3 through 5 says this. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism, raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father. Even we also should walk in newness of life. Now listen to this carefully. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in resurrection. Baptism for the faithful, repentant believer puts one into resurrection life. I know your Bibles in Romans uh, 6, verse 3 through 6 there, says that we're risen in the likeness of resurrection, but in the likeness of is supplanted by the translators. It's italicized, and when you remove that, you rise in resurrection, not in the likeness of it. And it doesn't come to physical marriage. It comes to being born again of the water and of the Spirit. Argument number two. Drew, do you commune with the Lord? In his book, he said he did. 1 Corinthians 11, 26. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. But Drew, Drew must believe that his community is different than that of the Corinthians. If he communes with the Lord... They did it showing the Lord's death till he come. Did you get that? The Corinthians, the first Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26, they did it looking forward for Jesus to come. Drew in his book says he does it with Jesus. I want to know what changed. Please tell me what changed between the Corinthians not having the Lord with them and you having him with you. I said the chain come, and we do have him now. And when I commune in the Lord's Supper every first day of the week, I commune with the Lord. Now, let's keep looking at this. Um, he says, uh, I, I, I go extemporaneously sometimes and lose my notes. They obviously communed, uh, let's see, but Jesus did return, then Drew, by his own argument, should not be partaking of the communion because he claims he partakes of the communion with the Lord. Did you get that? It's double language. He's talking out of two sides of his mouth. He says he communes with the Lord, but the Lord hasn't come. But if the Lord did come, we do it till the, we, till the Lord come, and then it ends. He has termination there, when indeed it's an eternal commandment, the government of that kingdom, there shall be no end to it. On page 134 of Drew's book, he claims that he partakes of the Lord's Supper with the Lord. Since the Corinthians were communing, waiting for the Lord's return, I want to know what changed. If Drew communes with the Lord and the Corinthians did not, the Lord must have returned. Drew's book misrepresents this, by the way, what the Bible actually says. Drew said, and I quote from his book, Christ's statement was that the saints would not take of the Lord's Supper until he drank it new with them in the kingdom. He cites Matthew 26, verse 29. But let's read that verse together. It never says anywhere that the saints wouldn't do it. It said, I... I said to you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Do you see what he must? Do you see what he must attempt to force his view? How he does that in Scripture? He cites, he miscites Matthew 26, verse number 29. It says the saints were to partake of it till the Lord came, but the text says Jesus would not partake of it until it was all fulfilled. 
I partake of it with the Lord because it was all fulfilled. The Lord has come. I partake of it with the Lord. He says he does, but then he's got to stop. Why do you partake of the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week? Because the Lord's not. If the Lord's here, you claim you, you commune with him. Drew hinges his contradictory view based on the word till in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26. The word, five minutes while, well, the word, however, does not demand termination. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you show the Lord's death till you come. Romans 5.13 says, For until, the exact same word there, the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. The word till there, if sin was in the world to the law, then when the law of Moses came, sin would have to terminate and be no more. If till meant termination. But till does not demand termination. This verse proves it in another by itself. We can go to a multitude of verses to show the same thing. A quick little simple illustration. When I would leave home, I'd tell my children, you'd be good till daddy gets home. Now, when I got home, does that mean now you can start acting up and being bad? No, it doesn't mean I expect you to terminate being good. It means if when I get home, there's going to be a change in the state of this household. I'm going to be back with you, and you've got to keep being good, just like they have to keep keeping the communion. Till does not mean termination. So what changed? The Lord did return when promised. I affirm the Lord has returned in the first century when he promised, and that Christians commune with the Lord when partaking of the Lord's Supper. Paul promised the Corinthians they would change when Jesus would come in their lifetime, before some of them would die. The text says, Behold, I showed a thousand years ago, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Paul wrote that letter to the Corinthians. We, 2,000 years ago, shall not all sleep, die, until the change happens. Well, what's that going to be, Paul? Verse 52, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the dead in Christ shall rise. The resurrection's coming. When's that going to be? We're not all going to die before it happens. My question is, did Paul lie? Did Paul lie on that? Paul was speaking about the spiritual change at the time of the end and not a miraculous change at the end of time. Drew changes, uh, and Drew change would be the, uh, and Drew's change would be the greatest miracle of all time. He still has miracles coming in his future. Let me drop, drop down here. Third argument. How much time do I have, Billy? Second Thessalonians 2. The text says, Not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by spirit or by a spoken word, or a letter seeming to be from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. ESV. Drew demands that in the King James Version, this word inistimai here means have come at hand, is at hand. But that word literally means has already arrived, has come. Young's Literal cites it. Uh, the ESV cites it. The New King James Version says, Christ hath arrived, arrived, Christ had come, he takes the King James Version, which has Paul contradicting himself. He has Paul contradicting Christ. Paul himself said, the night is far spent, the day is at hand, coming regarding the coming of the Lord, in Romans 13, 12. Philippians 4, 5, let your moderation be known unto all men, the Lord is at hand. Paul contradicts Peter now, because Peter said, the end of all things is at hand. John said it in Revelation chapter 1, verse 3, in Revelation chapter 22, verse 7 and 10. It is at hand. John wrote, it is the last hour. James wrote, the day of the Lord is at hand. You think Paul's going to come out and say, don't let anybody tell you that the Lord's not at hand, that his coming's not at hand? When he said it himself, when James said it, when John said it, when Jesus said it, when Peter seemed to believe it was never said. Don't believe it. Paul wrote, and he takes one faulty translation of a word that's never used ever in that way, except he makes it and forces it to try to fit his view, and it will not work. It just will not work. I cite some passages here of, of people that have said, and, and very highly scholarly men, far more than I will ever be, but McGarvey is one I have highlighted. He's a member of the church, highly regarded. Look what McGarvey says regarding 2 Thessalonians 2. Paul taught that the day of the Lord was at hand in Romans 13, 12. Paul taught it Philippians 4, 5. He did as did the other apostles. John, using the very strong expression in 1 John 2, 18, with the phrase, just at hand, is stronger still. 
It denotes an imminence, nothing short of the actual appearing of the Lord that next instant. Paul taught it in all these passages. Paul taught them to the, uh, to the Thessalonians. Paul taught the Thessalonians that God would repay those who would persecute them. Am I already? Okay, we'll get back to it. Thank you, Billy. Thank you. I'll just leave this on here. Yes, sir. Uh, no, you still have to break up into the speech. Unless you didn't use the dress code. You all right? my two minutes and just say a few words. First of all, uh, the book stand in the back, look, you can pay uh, Steve or Holger or whoever is trustworthy to get the money to me. If you want to buy books, you can leave it back there in the little container that's on the stand. I know some of you have asked about that. That's that's fine. Just go ahead and get the money to Steve or Holger. I trust they'll get the money to me. Now, the second thing I want to say is Steve and I have agreed to call each other by first name. So when I say Steve, Mr. Steve, don't think I'm being disrespectful. He is more than authorized to call me Drew, uh, or anything else for that matter. Uh, and then also I want to say my many thanks to Steve, to Holger, to Scott, whoever is in charge of this, and give you my many thanks for allowing me to come and speak. I appreciate the opportunity. But that being said, uh, as you can see, it's the Leonard Basin debate, August 4th through 6th. I appreciate your presence here, and I'll go ahead and start my time now. Hannah, if you'll get chart number uh, two. For, yes, two for me. I want to make a few preliminary remarks. And the first I want to say is my thanks to all that have supported it. Number two, I want to say that my task in the negative is to disprove what's in the affirmative. Now, how much argument did you hear proving that the resurrection has come? How much argumentation did you hear saying that the second coming has come? You heard one. When I look down, down at my notes, there is one argument, and that is if you've been baptized during the resurrection. I'll address that. But let me tell you, the job of the affirmative is to prove. There was not a whole lot of that done. There was a lot of disproving, if even that. Let me go further. Go to the next slide, Hannah. Take a look at this. The debate will be won by logical demonstration. Passion's great, but that doesn't prove anything. Number four, then, proving that a resurrection, a judgment, a coming, a... Two, that's not going to work. 
There were several of those. A casual glance at Isaiah 13, a casual glance at Ezekiel 33 and 4 teaches that there are several of these kind of things. Isaiah 19, 1. This will not prove his proposition. Saying James 5 says that the coming of the Lord draws nigh does not prove that the coming of the Lord, the final coming of the Lord, occurred in 70 AD. Now, Hannah, get on that line. Get uh, number 11. If I have proved my position, even of Christ that's yet futuristic, if I demonstrate that the bodily resurrection of 1 Corinthians 15 is yet futuristic, and because of 1 Corinthians 15, 23, either one is first thing, and he has not done it. He simply has not proven that the only coming of the Lord that was to be futuristic to the first century saints came within their lifetimes. And I'll address this 1 Corinthians 15 comment here in just a moment. Finding the issue number 10, chart number 10. Steve, thinking that there's only one kind of resurrection to be anticipated. It's a spiritual one, is what he's saying. He is suggesting that baptism is equivalent to resurrection, and he's trying to mislead you into thinking that's the only one. That's it. If you've been resurrected, guess what? You're, uh, if you've been baptized, you've been resurrected. I am saying that the New Testament characters experience two kinds, physical and spiritual. Incidentally, he did a fine equivocation on especially Matthew 26 and the words physical and the words spiritual, although those are not found in the text, in trying to equivocate and mislead you into thinking that if we are taking the Lord's Supper, we have to be physically with Christ. That is not the case. We are with Christ in the spiritual aspect. And that was taking place before the coming of the Lord, even in 70. They were with the Lord before then, and we are still with the Lord in a spiritual aspect now. We are not yet with Him in a physical aspect. Incidentally, Billy, if you'll get 1 John 3 and verse 2, I want, I want you to see something. 1 John 3, 2 has this to say. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. It doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when, we shall, when He shall appear, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. Were they with him or not yet? Until 70. They've got to be. What in the world does communion mean? What are you doing when you take the Lord's Supper today? Are you not communing with Christ? My question then is this. In Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47, were they not communing with our Lord when they took communion then? In Acts chapter 20 and verse 7, when they took the Lord's Supper before 70, mind you, were they not taking of the Lord's Supper in communion with Christ before 70 A.D.? That answers his Matthew 26 argument perfectly. The fact that brethren were taking of the Lord's Supper before 70 AD incidentally proves that he has already a presence in the kingdom in a spiritual way. Let me go back then. I want to talk about his Luke 20 argument. If you'll take a look at Luke 20 with me, not uh, Billy, if you'll get Luke 20, verse 34. Uh, take a look at this. In Luke chapter 20 and verse 34, what you have here. Is Jesus answering, said unto them, the children of this world, and Steve asserts that that is the Jewish age, marry and are given in marriage. But they which shall be accounted worthy to obtain that world, and he says that's the Christian age, he says you're in that now, guess what, the re they are worthy of obtaining that world and the resurrection from the dead, neither marry nor are given in marriage. Neither can they die anymore, for they are equal unto the angels and the children of God, being the children of the resurrection. He says all of that's happening. Look, he makes this argument on me being married and says, well, Drew shouldn't be married if it's all physical. I am saying Christ is discussing things after the physical age. His argument is a facade. It doesn't make sense. Luke 20, 34 through 36 does not in any way prove I shouldn't be married. He talks about Jewish labor marriage. None of that proves, and here's his proposition. Get chart, uh, get chart 6 for me, Hannah. He goes to Luke 20. What did he prove? Did he prove that Jesus has returned the second time in the first century for the judgment and the resurrection? Let him produce an argument that warrants that conclusion. He is not doing that. He is not giving us a syllogistic argument that says, therefore, Jesus has returned the second time in the first century for the judgment and the resurrection. That is what he needs to be doing. Now let me go on to 1 Corinthians 15. Take a look at 1 Corinthians 15 with me and take a look at verse 50, 51, and 52. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he made this argument. He says that the word we there, he spoke to Corinthians. He spoke to them then. He says that the Corinthians, we shall not all sleep, we shall not all physically die, but we shall all be changed. Well, take a look at 1 Corinthians 15, where it says that. In 15, in 15 verse 15, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption. I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. And he makes a very literal argument on the word we there and says, look, that has to happen in their lifetime. The resurrection of 1 Corinthians 15 had to come in their lifetime. Billy, please get for me 1 Thessalonians 4. 
And please get verse 16. You've got to catch this. He says, well, let's begin in verse 14. In 1 Thessalonians 4, in verse 14, he says, For if we believe, that's Paul incidentally too. We, includes Paul. Paul's right. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say, that's again Paul, unto we, is that inclusive of Paul or not? Which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. He's got to have Paul alive at the second coming, which he says in 70 A.D. Paul was not alive in 70 A.D. See, if you take this literally in the same way he took 1 Corinthians 15, and you say, well, the we there includes Paul, Paul should have been alive. He wasn't. Paul missed it regarding the resurrection. But let me tell you this. The we there is editorial. Paul is identifying with the body there, and he's making an argument saying, we as Christians, we as Christians shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Take a look, incidentally, then, at 2 Thessalonians 2. And I want to bring up this argument. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and Hannah, if you'll go ahead and get my, uh, well, let me get the chart for you. I believe it's, let's see here. Get chart 65. He has me contradicting Paul with Paul. That is not the case. That's not the case. He has misguided you into thinking that Paul only saw one day of the Lord. Paul saw several. Paul saw several just as Isaiah the prophet saw, saw several. A casual glance at Isaiah 13 shows that there was a day of the Lord at Babylon. What then are we to make up of 2 Thessalonians 2? He has a different day in mind. Paul undoubtedly has a different day in mind. Now watch this. Was AD 70 imminent? Was it at hand or not? In Matthew 16, 27 and 28, the word mellow is used, and these good brethren have argued extensively saying that mellow indicates imminence. In Matthew 16, 27, and 28, they say we're referring to 70 AD, and he had to be imminent. There is mellow used with the infinitive, and I've got charts to prove that if you need them. Christ, speaking of AD 70, says that it is imminent. Catch this. 20 years later, Paul comes along and says the day of the Lord is not imminent, 2 Thessalonians 2. Who is right, Christ or Paul? Steve's view has Christ and Paul contradicting. The question I'm asking is, was Christ looking at 70 as being imminent or not? If he was, why then would he say in Luke 21, 28, then after the signs, you'll see your redemption draws nigh. Why after the signs, then the kingdom is nigh at hand? Was Christ looking at AD 70 as being imminent or not? Their argument on Melo is a farce. Now, you take a look at Paul in 2 Thessalonians 2, 2, and Steve argued extensively saying that the word anistomy there is not referring to something that is just at hand. He says it refers to something that was past. Brethren, good brethren, I want you to see Steve Basin's position before he, right after, I mean right after we agreed to this debate back in February, I want you to see what was on his Facebook page. If you take a look at chart, oh, uh, let's see here, uh, 42, and if you bring up 42, here's Steve Basin's Facebook page just after we signed the propositions, and he says, read the KJV Bible. Go to the next slide, get 43. Here's Ludington Church of Christ on their webpage. The King James Version of the Bible is used as a primary translation. We do not issue blanket condemnation on all other versions used for comparative study, but recognize the KJV is one of the most reliable. Now he's arguing that the KJV on one side of his platform is, oh, it's a good version. It's a good version. We authorize it. But on the other side, he says, look, KJV, well, that's a bad rendering. We shouldn't take it. Why? Because it hurts his doctrine. Now, let me tell you the good scholars that say that is imminent is a good translation of 2 Thessalonians 2. A.T. Robertson, Marvin Vincent, your major versions, the King James Version, I know that these good brethren appreciate it. But guess what? You've also got J.W. McGarvey. He brought up a quote from McGarvey. McGarvey renders it as is imminent. Also, you've got the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament saying that there is definitely future involved, not has come. What does that mean then? Go back to my chart. Go back, Hannah, if you would, and take a look at 60, uh, what is it, 60, 65. Take a look at it again. Christ speaks of 70 and says it is at hand. 20 years later, Paul comes along and says the day of the Lord speaking as they say of 70 is not at hand. That is a contradiction between Christ and Paul. That cannot be. That is problematic. They need to address that. They either need to give up their argument on mellow. They should. Let me tell you, they should. Or they need to see that Paul was speaking of a different day than Christ did in Matthew 16. That is also the case. They need to give that up. AD 70 at hand or not, Christ and Paul are at odds if they say yes. Now, let me get into it. Uh, let's see here. 
end of 68. Cut 68. This is the prison that Basin is in. Basin is here in this box. And go to the next slide, 69. His doctrine implies universalism. I've got negative arguments on all of this. He says that there is no strength for sin. He says that explicitly on 1 Corinthians 15, 56. No strength for sin. Brethren, if you don't have a strength for sin at all today, you don't have sin at all. That's universalism. Who can sin? How do you commit sin? By breaking the law, Romans 4, 15, 1 John 3, 4. Go to the next slide, Hannah. They imply once saved, always saved. Now keep in mind, they are not teaching these explicitly. Holger, Steve, all these good brethren will not say, look, we have uh, uh, affirm universalism. They will not say that. They will not say that everybody that was once saved is always saved. But their doctrine implies it. How? Because in Luke 20, 34-36, it says those that are worthy to obtain that world can die no more. How do you die, spiritually speaking? Through committing sin. If you cannot die anymore, you cannot sin. Their doctrine implies that once you're resurrected spiritually, and you come up out of that grave of baptism, you can die no more. Go to the next slide. Christ died spiritually. They argue this. It's my understanding explicitly. Christ died spiritually, was set aside from the Father for three literal days, 24-hour periods, and Christ is there living in the Hadean world. Incidentally, I don't know how you have him in paradise. You've got him going to paradise while he's separated from the Father. Who can believe it? Who can believe it? Christ died spiritually? Hardly. Hardly. And they say that was the thing for the atonement of sin. Go to the next, go to the next slide. No passages for future fulfillment. They try to argue about application. They try to argue about future judgment for you individually. But my question is this. Where's the passage that speaks of individualistic judgment? And if you find one, how was that fulfilled in 70? Do you have a judgment upcoming or not? If so, where's the passage? Let's prove it. Let's prove it. Let's see the passage that teaches such. They have no passages for future fulfillment. Incidentally, they say that every scripture was fulfilled by 70. Good brethren, I am more than ready to take that on. I am more than ready to show you Zechariah 14 where that cannot be. Revelation 20 verse 7 where that can't be. Where that cannot be. Daniel 7 where that cannot be. They say everything was fulfilled by 70. That cannot be right. Was Rome's fall predicted or not? In Daniel 2, 44 and 45, the kingdom of Christ was going to overcome the kingdoms of this world, including the Roman kingdom. Now, did Rome fall within 70? It cannot be. Even they won't teach that. They've got to get over Daniel 2, 44 and 45. That cannot be the case. Go to one more, Hannah. And we've already seen this Christ and Paul contradicting. They've got that in 2 Thessalonians 2, 2. They've got Christ saying back here in Matthew 16, around 33 AD, look, AD 70 is at hand. 20 years later, Christ comes, or Paul comes along and says, look, the day of the Lord, and they say that's speaking of 70 also, is not at hand. That is extremely problematic. Now I want to get into the questions a little bit. Steve asked, uh, let's go ahead and take a look then at uh, 84. I asked this question of Steve. Incidentally, he gave me none. Not that that's problematic, that's fine. But here was my first question to him. Select each of the following that is true. Physically dead people resurrected out of spiritual death before physically living people. Physically living people resurrected out of spiritual death before physically dead people. Or physically dead people resurrected out of spiritual death at the same time as physically living people. You will not believe the answer he put down. None true. None true. Brethren, that is a strong disjunction. I don't know if you know what that means, but every proposition that is worded precisely must be true or false. Drew is a human being. Or Drew is a non-human being. Those are your only two options. They are a strong disjunction. One of these has to be the case. He said none are true. You can't have that. When did they resurrect? Give me one individual who's resurrected. He had to be a physically dead person at one point to resurrect them, or he had to be physically living. But you've got a strong disjunction. At best, what you can have is the case that physically dead people resurrected at the same time. They say none. None of those. It has to be one. Good logic tells you it has to be one of these things. It has to be. And they say none of those are true. Well then, brethren, guess what? You don't have anybody having resurrected out the same day. That is how we answer the question. Do you catch that? He says none of these are the case. Then nobody's resurrected. Or are we not to look at resurrection as a time thing, as they've argued extensively? Oh, for sure, that's for sure. But they say in a spiritual aspect, none are true. 
Can you beat that? My, my. Go on to the next slide, and take a look at number five. The body in 1 Corinthians 15 is or was the Judaic body to be resurrected in 70? And his answer is, not precise enough. Hey, get chart 46 for me. I want to show you what Holden Neubauer has said regarding 1 Corinthians 15. Isaiah spoke of the dead body of Judaism, which would come out of Hades as a corporate entity. I don't need him to answer my true or false questions. Trust me, I've got charts. Of... This was necessary because the law could not deliver them from the dead. He says the dead body of Judaism was a corporate entity. Take a look at the next chart. Go to 47. And then on process, he says a spiritual death was being destroyed. A new spiritual rule was being established. Simultaneously. They're in, they're in process at the same time. Now with that being said, you have got to see the problem they are in. There's one body. Judaism. That's what he just argued on chart 46. Chart 47, he says it's going into the grave at one point. It's coming up at the same time. Whereas in text, the power of Paul's argumentation in 1 Corinthians 15, 36. You've got to see what Paul said when he says, Thou fool, how can something that hasn't even died be resurrected? They've got the body of Judaism dying and rising. Hannah, get from me, chart 47. And take a look at this. They've got the Judaic body rising out of the grave from 30 to 70 at the same time it's dying from 30 to 70. It hasn't even fully died and they've got a resurrection happening to a body that's not even dead. Brethren, you don't go to the doctor and have your doctor try to resurrect you and you're not even dead yet. You get healing. They have got a problem with the fact that the body of Israel is not even dead and they've got it rising again and Paul's point in 1 Corinthians 15, 36 is fools, you cannot have something quickened except it first die. There are problems all over with this doctrine. Now let me go further. I, I don't even think he made an affirmative argument, really. Go to Romans chapter... Well, go to Colossians, uh, Billy. If you'll get Colossians chapter 2, 11 through 13, and I want to take a look at Hannah. If you'll get my chart... Um, let's get 86, chart 86. Here's the third question I asked him. We've got to exchange three questions. Here's my third. Some individuals were resurrected in the 1 Corinthians 15 cents before A.D. 70. You will not believe what he answered here. He said, well, in promise. In promise. His argument in his speech was that if you've been baptized, you've resurrected. Is that not what he said? That's what he said. If you've been baptized, you've been resurrected. And then he says, well, only in promise. Whether resurrected or not, hand on one more chart before I read Billy's passage. Uh, get, uh, let's see what Basin had to say in chart um, 31. 31. You can't beat this stuff, guys. You cannot beat it. 25 says, in verse 25, he told them the hour is coming, and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. Yes, they could come back to life, he promised. That's not what he said. He said they can come back to life now. Now, is that true or is it not? Could they be resurrected before 70 or not? I want him to affirm when they resurrected, and if he says one way or the other, brethren, I've got him on the point of a dilemma, he will never escape. If you take a look then at Colossians chapter 2, watch this. The Apostle Paul wrote in Colossians 2 verse 11, In whom ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein ye are risen, that's not past tense, you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. I've got to stop. More later. Thank you for your kind attention. We're going to take a five-minute bathroom break. If you guys really have five minutes. Uh, Steve, you want me to turn this off or leave it on? Sorry? You want me to turn it off or leave it on? All right. Okay. Okay. Yeah.
Yeah. And you know it's coming, right? Let's be finding uh let's be finding our seats now, please. We need to get going. Whoever's coming, let's go. We're going to get going right now in just a moment, please. Okay. And what we'll do, I guess there's a, there's a line at the bathrooms. We'll open up the church building. We go up to uh, the ramp and into the door of the church building. We're going to open up two bathrooms there as well. Since this building only has two, Lee's already got it. So... If you're waiting in this line, this line's long, go on out to the church building, uh, right right behind us here, available as well. So feel free to help yourself to uh, use either one. Are we ready? Are we ready? <laughs> That's what they would say. You ready? Yeah, ready, Kirk? Yes, sir. Let's go. One of the things that he wanted to take an argument about was how he had said, how I answered his question number four. Precisely stated questions, and if precisely stated, they either can be or should be answered in true or false. And I wrote on there, they were not precisely stated enough because that's exactly what I meant. When he wrote, physical body, uh, coming back to life before spiritual resurrection, but after life, before the physical, and all these things. Listen, I thought he was talking about in his paradigm at the end of the world. That's exactly, and that's why I answered it the way I did. He may have meant today, right now. He may have meant 2,000 years ago. He may have meant 2,000 years in the future. I don't know exactly what he meant. I couldn't answer it precisely because it wasn't precisely stated. So, let's move back now. He tried to get into the affirmative. He tried coming out and taking the affirmative argument. His problem is he's in the negative. He needs to follow and he needs to answer. Let's go back to 2 Thessalonians 2, 2, where I left off earlier. Paul taught, now listen, his argument is, 
that Paul said by the King James Version, which is his version, which I believe is one of the more accurate translations. I don't deny that. We have that. We believe that. But it's not infallible. Men wrote it. Men made mistakes. There's many mistakes in the King James, just like there is in the ASV, which he cited, the ESV, etc. So before you start basing your whole argumentation on one questionable word in one place, you better get it right first or don't make that argument. The Apostle Paul told the Thessalonians, he told them, uh, let's look at the chart here, that God would repay those who were persecuting them, the Jews. Now, that church of Thessalonica had to be recompensed, repaid to those who were persecuting them. When would that happen? Who was persecuting them? According to 1 Thessalonians 2.17, it was the Jews. According to Acts 17, it was the Jews. It was the Jews who would receive the recompense, the repayment, and reward for the recompense. That was at hand by his own admission. He says, Matthew 16, 27 and 28, he uses the word metal there, we'll get into that later on. He says that was at hand when Jesus said it, 40 years before it actually happened, regarding the destruction of Jerusalem and the punishment upon the wicked Jews. He comes to the book of Thessalonians, throws it out the window, and he says, Paul's talking about something different than Jesus. Excuse me, that is not the case. And uh, let's go, I'm going to go look at my Bible version here now. And 2 Thessalonians, excuse me, 1 Thessalonians 4, 14. Here's his argument. Paul says, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. This is his argument. This we say unto you by the word of the Lord. That's what Paul said. Paul says, let me tell you what Jesus said. Let me remind you, Thessalonians, what the Lord said. Well, what did Jesus say? Matthew chapter 16, verses 27 and 28. I'm going to come in the glory of the Father. I'm going to come with my angels. I'm going to reward every man according to their works. Verily I say unto you, there will be some standing here which shall not taste the death. You see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. And that's exactly what the Apostle Paul was telling the Thessalonians. And then he turns right around and writes a second letter to them and tells them God's going to repay those wicked Jews who were persecuting them before they would all die. He says it's not a hand. Jesus said it was. He says Paul's talking about something different than Jesus. Make no mistake about it. Paul didn't mix things up like that. Neither did Jesus Christ. Now, let me go back to, uh, to my PowerPoint presentation here. Uh, i get a couple other things. I'm sorry. Paul taught them God would repay the Jews. Paul taught them the day of the Lord would come before some of them would die. And when he said, we shall not sleep, but we shall all be changed, we shall not all. He wasn't emphatically pointing to every single one of them that was living there. He was talking in reference to not every one of us will. Some of us may. Some of us will not. The exact same warning that Jesus used in Matthew 16, 27, and 28, where Jesus said, we shall, uh, uh, some of us standing here shall not taste the death. Some of us. Not all of us, some of us. So, did Paul die before he'd be 70? Yes, I believe he did. But Paul was speaking there in, in corporate terms of those who were there. They would not all die. Some would still be remaining at that time. Paul taught them the man of sin, the son of perdition, was already alive and working. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. Working on what? The day coming of the coming of resurrection when the man of sin, the son of perdition, would be revealed. Again, Paul taught Romans 13, 12, the night is far spent, the day is at hand. Listen, he taught the Romans, he taught the Romans this, he taught the Philippians this, he taught the Corinthians this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17, the Apostle Paul said, I teach the same thing in every church. I don't go to Philippi and teach them something different than I do at Thessalonica. I don't go to Corinth and teach them something different than I do Rome. I teach the same thing at every church. Now he's got Paul lying. He's got it all mixed up. He's preaching one message to the Thessalonians, another message to the Philippians. He's all over the board. We're here talking about the final coming, the day of the Lord, of which there is only one. Drew wants you to believe that Paul did not teach these things. I affirm exactly what Paul said. The resurrection would come before they would all die. Just as Jesus taught, it was at hand. Matthew 16, 27, and 28. 
Now, he's got to follow me. I'm in the affirmative. Let's identify Babylon for just a moment. Babylon, the mother of all harlots that sat on the beast. Rome carried Jerusalem on her back. Economically, in Matthew chapter 22, verses 19 and 20, uh, they said, show me the tax money. So they brought him in a denarius, a coin, and he said unto them, whose image and inscription is this? They began to accuse him, saying, we found this fellow perverting the nation and forbidding to give tribute economically to Caesar, saying that himself is a king. They used Roman currency. The standard of the day was Roman economics. Rome carried Jerusalem economically. Politically, we have no other king but Caesar, they would say, when they wanted Christ to be killed. He is our king. Rome carried Jerusalem politically. Militarily, Rome carried Jerusalem on her back. Military, militarily, Paul would say, I appeal unto Caesar. Caesar sent, and the Rome sent, and the Roman soldiers escorted him to Rome. They were the civil government uh, that they were uh, uh, under at that time. They were militarily leading and carrying them at that time. They were politically carrying them at that time. They were economically carrying them at that time. And let's take a look at this characteristic here. Now remember, I'm in the affirmation. I'm affirming Babylon the Great. Let's look at Babylon's characteristics. Sat on the beast. Babylon sat on the beast and was carried by the beast. Revelation 17, 3 through 7. That's Jerusalem. Jerusalem sat on the back of Rome, militarily, economically, politically, etc. Babylon was the mother of all harlots. Revelation. Listen, even he wanted to appeal to Daniel 2. We're going to go there if he wants this before I look forward to that. But Jerusalem and Israel was there in leading their own nations. They were on the top of the hill, so to speak, before Babylon came in and took them. And then the Medes and Persians come in and took them. And then the Grecians come in and took them. And then the Romans come in and took them. But he says, Rome is the mother of all harlots. I mean, she's the great, 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 great granddaughter of the greatest harlot, Jerusalem. Jerusalem was the mother of all harlots, not Rome. And by the way, Hosea affirms that. In Hosea chapter 4, verse 1, Hear the word of the Lord, you children of Israel. They, Jerusalem... Committing adultery, I will destroy thy mother. Who? Israel. She was the adulteress. It's not Rome who come along many years later. Babylon was guilty of the blood of all the righteous. Jesus said, I hold you responsible for all the righteous blood shed on the earth. From the blood of Zacharias, uh, from the blood of Abel, righteous Abel, to the blood of Zacharias, son of Barcaius, whom you slew between the temple and the altar, verily I say to you, all these things shall come upon this generation. Uh, you cannot escape the damnation of hell. Fill you up the measure of, of your wrath. God's coming upon you, this wicked generation, because you're responsible for all the righteous blood shed on the earth. He's got Rome being that. People were called to come out of her. Listen, Jesus said when you see Jerusalem's being compassed with armies, you flee to the mountains. You get out of Jerusalem. He's got people trying to come out of Rome as being the great, the great Babylon. Babylon was to be rewarded double. Babylon was to be rewarded. He says Babylon, the great, is Rome. When was Rome rewarded double? I want to know when she was rewarded single, much less double. Jerusalem was captured by Babylon first. And then she was destroyed by the Roman army through the means of the Lord. And he'd be sent me double she was rewarded for her wickedness and, and, and evilness. The saints, the apostles, the prophets were avenged with her. Jerusalem, 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 Jerusalem. We could give many other passages, but let's take a look at this now. Jude says the fourth beast, beast was Rome. Rome was Babylon the Great. Pages 299 and 300, that's his words. Rome was Babylon the Great, according to Drew. But John, the writer of Revelation, says... A woman sits on the beast. A woman sits on the beast? Who is it? She is full of abomination and fornication. Well, who is it? Her name is Babylon the Great, mother of all harlots. Who is this woman sitting on the beast? She was drunken with the blood of all the saints. Jesus, the Bible always continually says it's Jerusalem. The woman, Babylon the Great, Jerusalem is carried by the beast. Rome was carrying Jerusalem. The beast hates the whore. Now get this. 
the beast, which is the woman sitting on the beast, Babylon the Great, and will make her desolate. You think Rome hated herself and wanted to make herself desolate? Listen, what kind of ideology does he got going here? This is crazy. Babylon the Great, the woman which sat on the beast, has fallen. This is not the beast. It is the woman that sat on the beast. That is Babylon the Great. The woman that sat on the beast is Jerusalem. The woman on the back of the beast, the harlot, Babylon the Great. Jerusalem is rewarded double. Revelation 18, 6. Revelation 18, 10. Judgment came, the great city of Babylon. The woman that sat on the beast is Jerusalem. Heaven, the apostles, etc. Got to be Jerusalem. The Bible says by Babylon the Great was the woman that sat on the beast. And the beast hated her, drew, Leonard says Rome, which is the beast, is Babylon the Great. But the Bible says Babylon the Great is the woman that sat on the beast. Hmm. He's got the, that's like, let me give you an analogy. The one trigger. Trigger was a horse, a beast, a burden that carried the lone ranger. He's like me calling the lone ranger the beast, the horse. Oh no, that's not going to work. That's not going to work. The Bible says that when Babylon the Great is fallen, all these things would take place. Jerusalem was the focus of Revelation when all these things written would be shortly uh, fulfilled. That is when the Lord would return. Revelation 22, 6, 7, 10, 12, 20. That's Matthew 16, 27, 28. That's Matthew 24, Luke 21, etc. That is when the new heaven and the new earth would come. That's when the marriage takes place. Notice Revelation talks about all these things, and the references to all these things are found in the Bible, not secular history. The Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 3, uh, 13 were to compare spiritual things with spiritual. I compare what John wrote to what Matthew wrote. I compare what John wrote to what Isaiah wrote to what perhaps Paul would say. I don't compare it to secular history. People like Irenaeus or, or Eusebius or whoever else you want to cite. We need to see exactly what Jesus said about this and he's the author of this book and not Irenaeus and not the secular historians. This is when the books were opened. There's judgment. This is when the great judgment takes place. When? When Jerusalem is fallen. This is when the thousand years is fulfilled. On all things written, what happened in Revelation 8, we're going to go there. That's Psalms 90. We're going to hit some of these things. That is uh, when the seventh, the last trumpet would sound. Revelation 11, 15, the last trumpet would sound. Didn't Jesus say the trumpet would sound when he would come in judgment in the clouds with the angels? Right? You remember this? With the trumpet of God to gather together the elect from the four corners of the earth, from everywhere. All the dead are going to be gathered. This is the great judgment scene when the trumpet's going to what Revelation is talking about. He believes it's wrong somehow, but all know the Bible is not mixing things up the way he does. And when uh, that's when God would tabernacle with his people. Let me, uh, uh, you can see where I'm going. I affirm these things were all completed in the first century. Just as Scripture demands, okay, that is when Babylon the Great, Jerusalem is fallen, and that happened when Jesus said it would, A.D. 70, in that generation. Now, Drew agrees with me on this point. And I give you credit for this, Drew. You take a totally different view of this than 99% of the rest of our brethren. He says you must honor the at-hand statements. He said when something says it is at-hand... It must be imminent at hand. It's got to be. So therefore, he believes the beast is Rome, and when Rome would fall, all the things of Revelation was fulfilled. He believes Revelation 1, 7, every eye shall see him, was fulfilled. He believes the books were opened. He believes Satan was cast down into the bottomless pit. He believes the great judgment scene of Revelation chapter 20 came, but he believes it was with Rome, Babylon the Great, which he says is the beast. It will not fit. No, Rome was the beast that carried Babylon the Great. Either that or John was wrong. Or he is wrong. And I'm going to go with the great apostle John. Now, uh, let me look at uh, a couple of other of his arguments here. Um, we are here to discuss the resurrection. Let me go there, if I can. Let me... Let me get out here. I'd like to bring this for you on the screen. I think it's a little bit easier to see this. In Matthew chapter um, 12. Matthew chapter 12, verses 41 and 42. If I can 
need my fingers to work here. Matthew, Matthew 12, 41. Listen, Matthew 12, beginning verse 38. A wicked... These people wanted to see a sign of Jesus. Jesus, show us a sign. Jesus said, a wicked and adulterous generation seeketh that their sign. There should be no sign giving it, saying that of Jonah the prophet. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, so too shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And then he said this in verse number 41. The men of Nineveh shall rise. Now listen to me carefully and closely. Nineveh had been destroyed centuries earlier. They were dead. Where were they? At this time, they were in Hades. That's where they were. They were dead. They're going to rise. From what? Death. Now, Nineveh represents both the just and the unhindered at the preaching of Jonah, but then again, they turned away from the righteousness they fell, and God destroyed Nineveh, and they were all dead. But Jesus said they were going to rise. They are going to rise? Sure. With this generation, with this, uh, they're going to rise in the judgment, resurrection in the judgment with this generation. Jesus said it. Now, who can believe it? Believest thou this? I believe it. Nineveh was going to rise in the resurrection, in the judgment with this generation. Which generation? This generation, adulterous, wicked one that's seeking after a sign, the one that I'm crucified in, that's when the judgment and the resurrection takes place. The queen of the south, she will rise, resurrection, and the judgment with this generation shall condemn it, for she came from the other most parts to see the wisdom of Solomon, and behold, the greater than Solomon is here. Listen, Jesus said that woman, that, that woman that wanted to see the beautiful glory and wisdom of Solomon would rise. She'd been dead for a thousand years practically. She's going to rise. That's resurrection. From what? Death. You think she was walking around still alive then? Living? No. When? In the, ju uh, in the judgment with this generation. He wants to, uh, let me go to some of his other arguments here. Uh, I, uh, he wanted to talk about the communion of the Lord. Listen. Why? Well, Affirm, I commune with the Lord every first day of the week because the Lord has returned. The Corinthians, this text specifically says, you who show the Lord's death by doing this till he come. All right? Will they partake of the communion? Yep. Were they observing the memorial of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ? Yes. How were they doing it with the Lord? Through the Holy Spirit. I will not leave you comfortless. I will send the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit was the earnest, the down payment that was given until the full payment was made. That's exactly how that happens. That's exactly how that happens. They were partaking of it with the Lord through the promise of the Holy Spirit, which is only an earnest payment, which would end when the redemption would come. We're going to get into that, but quickly, Jesus said that the redemption would come in Luke 21, verse 28, in that generation when Jerusalem was compassed with armies, the miraculous measure of the Holy Spirit would be gone. Jesus would be there literally. No more need for any down payment. No need for any earnest money. It would be taken care of in its entirety at that point in time. Now, uh, what else did he say here? I do not have to prove uh, I've been there mellow comparing this to my how much time that Billy? Eight seconds. I'll leave it at that. Oh, 
speech, and then I'll get very quickly into my negative. Uh, but go ahead and take a look. Hannah, if you'll pull up chart, uh, let's get, well, let's get 95. You can't make this stuff up, brethren. Here is Paul saying, him and I have some who concerning the truth have heard, saying that the resurrection has passed already, and overthrow the faith of some. Paul is writing later in his life, and he says, if you're saying resurrection is past already, resurrection's already happening, you're in error. Here is what Steve is saying. On John 5, 25, this is far before that. 
Steve is saying, yes, they could come back to life now. And I referenced his quote on that in my last speech. I don't need to do it again. He is contradicting Paul. Who is right? Are you going to take an inspired apostle? Or are you going to take Steve Bazin in the 21st century who says, yes, they could come back to life now? And he says it too early. He is right there putting himself, incidentally, in the same camp with him and A.S. and my negative. I had to bring that to your attention because of how blatantly false it is. Now let me take a look at this. He says um, the KJV has many mistakes. He still isn't answering the argument. He references the KJV several points. Vincent Rosen and Kittles, incidentally. I've given you those points where they render an estimate as the way it stands. So my argument on 2 Thessalonians 2, 2 in relation to Mark 16, 27, 28 still stands. They've still got Christ contradicting Paul. Now, uh, well, let me, let me take a look at this. He brings up the Jews, and he says in 2 Thessalonians 1, 9, or uh, 2 Thessalonians 1, 6, is it, that they were going to be recompensed according to such. Well, take a look at 1 Thessalonians 1, 9. Uh, Billy, if you'll get 1 Thessalonians 1, 9, okay, we're having issues here. Can we stop the time right quick? Uh, sure, Billy. Okay, stop the time. Okay. 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 okay, are we running through much, too much past through this? Plug yours, plug in mine. No, so it's it's the projector. The projector shut off. Oh, okay. 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 All the settings should be fine, I think. No signal. Okay, you should have. I'm sorry about this. If we need to, we can just go ahead and use the text. I think that'd be best. Like, forget about the verses on PowerPoint and just use the Bible? Yes. Okay, okay, okay. We'll do that then. Let's hold off on that. If you get it running, go ahead. That's correct. Okay. All right, so here's my argument then. Let's start my time again, Billy. Take a look with me in your Bibles at 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 9. He makes this argument that the Jews have to be the ones recompensed. Well, this is not an exclusive judgment on the Jews. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 9, it says, For they themselves show of us what manner of injury in we had unto you, and how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. He is writing to Gentiles. And to prove that, verse 2 says nearly the same kind of phraseology. Except it adds one thing. It says in 1 Corinthians 12, 2, You know that you were Gentiles carried away unto these dumb idols even as you were led. Now, is this judgment exclusively on the Jews, or is it upon Gentiles also? These are individuals who have abandoned idolatry for Christianity. And what you have here, then, is a case where there are Gentiles involved also. And to further prove my point, I'll go to 1 Thessalonians 2, 14. He says, You brethren became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus, for ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they of the Jews. You mean to tell me no Gentiles are involved in this? And if it is Gentiles, how did they receive judgment in 70 AD? It doesn't make sense. It doesn't add up. Now let me go further. So he asserts that point. Well, it had to be upon the Jews. Well, the Gentiles are there also. I hate to break it to you. Furthermore, he says that Paul and Jesus said the same exact thing when it comes to the matter of eschatology in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And to prove that, he goes to 1 Thessalonians 4.14. Read it with me. He says, for, or verse uh, 15, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. And his argument is that that phrase, by the word of the Lord, has to mean that Christ said it. Well, take a look with me at 1 Kings chapter 13, if you would. And in 1 Kings chapter 13, you have a phrase used that is not even remotely limited to the words of our Lord Jesus Christ as a person being here on this planet Earth. In 1 Kings chapter 13, verse 9, watch it with me. Here's a prophet. It says, it was charged me by the word of the Lord. Take a look at verse 17. 1 Kings 13, 17. It was said to me, by the word of the Lord. Now, keep in mind, all of this was said by Christ in his personal ministry. You've got to remember that. 
See, whatever the individual in 1 Kings 13 is saying, Christ said it back in his personal ministry. That's extremely problematic. Taking that phrase exclusively to mean that Christ said it during his personal ministry harms the text in 1 Kings 13. They cannot do that. It's a mere assertion and we'll wait for them to prove that by the word of the Lord exclusively means that our Lord said it in his personal ministry. Furthermore, uh, okay, well, let me make this point very quickly. I like how he quickly abandoned his argumentation on Luke 20, his argumentation on 1 Corinthians 15. Let's see those arguments again. Let's see those again. But keep in mind then, and I want to get into this extremely, he goes through this whole babbling on Babylon. And what he says is Babylon is Jerusalem. Babylon can't be Rome. Jerusalem is Rome. Get my chart number six, incidentally, Hannah. Watch this. Babylon is... Watch it with me. Jesus has returned the second time to the first century for the judgment of the resurrection. Can you beat that? That's not an affirmative argument. That doesn't prove that. That doesn't work. That he wasted half of his speech arguing that Babylon is Jerusalem. And what does that prove? That Christ has returned the second time in the first century for the judgment of the resurrection? It's time we hear an affirmative argument that we can actually work with. And he asserts, well, prove that the, he says that the Corinthians and the Philippians, they all heard the same thing. Look, Paul spoke of different days. Paul had in mind different days at different times, and I don't even think you would buy that he always looked at 70 AD. I could be wrong about that. But then take a look at this. Take a look. Um, well, I've got, I've got a few charts I might think about going to. We'll hold off on that. Uh, so he argues that Babylon is Jerusalem. He makes this argument about adultery and the mother, and he says Hosea in chapter 4 said that it had to be Israel. Look, you've got the same language in Isaiah 23, verses 15 through 18, used about Tyre. You've got the same kind of language used in Nahum 3, verse 4, about Nineveh. Basically, basically he's arguing that because here's a harlot, here's a harlot, here's a mother, here's a mother, here's a woman, here's a woman. He says, guess what? Jerusalem, 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 Jerusalem. That is some of the worst argumentation I've heard, Brethren. You cannot take same language and automatically start saying, well, that's the same event, same identity. Hosea said it. Hosea is not talking about what's going on in the book of Revelation. I hate to break it to you. It's used by those before about other nations as well. Tyre, Sidon, Nineveh. And so the argument is a farce. Then he brings up this. He says Trigger and the Lone, Dr R Lone Ranger and he goes on about that. Maybe they'll do something. It's like Lone Ranger riding on Trigger. But you know what else? Maybe Trigger and Lone Ranger will help you prove your proposition. Jesus has returned the second time in the first century for the judgment and the resurrection. We still haven't seen an argument that says therefore this is the case. And he argues, you know, extensively in the book of Revelation. He wanted to go to Revelation. Revelation doesn't prove this point. He wants to go to Revelation again and again and again and again. He has held up two books, Foy Wallace and Franklin Camp. They have argued extensively that Franklin Camp and Foy Wallace were teaching these two books, and they hold them up. I've seen them do it on their live streams. But here's the thing. In Franklin Camp's book on page XI11, he says this. I want to add one final word. Occasionally I see where someone that has accepted Max King's teaching quotes from my book along with other brethren. Any attempt to use anything in my book as though it lends any support to their teaching is a perversion and must take the quote out of context. Such tactics are unworthy of any that understand Christian principles and fair play. Franklin Camp teaches 80-70? Hardly. Then, here's Floyd Wallace. If you take a look at what Floyd Wallace had to say, they argued, he argued in his speech. The books were open. We see a coming of Christ. We see a resurrection. Look, nobody's debating that. But Boy Wallace, one of their greatest advocates that they appeal to, said this, Let it be impressed on the minds of the readers of Revelation that these visions of resurrection, second death, judgment, were all extraordinary and of special character. They were not intended for future and, future and general application. They belong to the apocalypse, and the apocalypse belong to that period. The depiction of the first resurrection and the second death were not meant for expositions of the doctrine of the resurrection from the dead and the future eternal punishment of the wicked, abundantly taught elsewhere in numerous scriptures. Though the imagery has basis in these fundamental doctrinal truths, the visions of Revelation were limited in application to the pageantry of apocalyptic description of the fortunes of the early church and the divine judgments on its enemies. For what Wallace teaches AD 70 as being the final coming of Christ, Take a look at what he says in 1-7. Take a look at what he says all throughout his commentary where he says there is still a futuristic bodily resurrection, coming of Christ. Franklin Camp, Floyd Wallace, do not teach what these brethren are trying to persuade you to take. And to say so is to harm their good reputation. Now, he says Babylon is Jerusalem. I'll grant it. For the sake of this debate, take it away. It's Jerusalem. This is what we need. A therefore Jesus has returned the second time in the first century for the judgment and the resurrection. Have you seen that? Let me tell you, tomorrow I will demonstrate how to affirm a proposition. And I'll do it quite effectively at that. 
But I will give you arguments that warrant the conclusion, therefore, there's a futuristic bodily resurrection of physically dead biological individuals. That is how we're going to affirm it tomorrow. Today, he has not done this. I hate to break it to you. He has not affirmed the proposition yet. Now, he says all of that. He brings up secular history. <laughs> he says, we don't accept secular history. Uh, he said, at best, he says, we accept what the Bible teaches. Amen to that. I'll give you an amen on that. But guess what? There is not a historical record, meaning looking back in a retrospective way, account of A.D. 70 as taking place in the Bible any more than there is one of Rome's. They are always prospective. They are prophetic. They are prospective. They are towards that end. What I'm saying is A.D. 70 is as historically written about as Rome's fall. I accept the same account like that as Steve does. Did Rome fall? He brings up Daniel 2 and he said, if we want to get into Daniel 2, 44 and 45, we will. I do. I do want to get into Daniel 2, 44 and 45. I want to know how that was fulfilled by 70. So we trust you'll answer that question when you get back up. Uh, let me go a little further then. Uh, I guess I'm just not seeing this affirmative argument. I, I guess you're not either. Then in Matthew 20, uh, 12, 41, I want to point out a horrible misrepresentation of the text. In Matthew chapter 12, and verse 41, he makes this argument that Nineveh is going to rise in the judgment with this generation. But did you see how he slipped the word in there? During. During. It does not say the judgment is coming during this generation when Nineveh will rise. It says this in 41, The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation. Amen. Amen. Because guess what? There is a day coming, Acts 17, 30, 31, 32, when all will stand before the judgment seat of God. That is the final time. It is not yet here. So what we see then in Matthew 12, 41 is a misrepresentation when he says, The men of Nineveh shall rise during. They're going to rise in judgment during this generation. That is not the case. That is not the case. Let me affirm to you that the Jews, the Gentiles, all of us here this evening, will stand before judgment at some time together. That is what 1241 teaches. Incidentally, John 5, 28 and 29 has the same kind of thing in mind. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming when all that are in the grave shall hear his voice, and they shall come forth unto you the damnation for everlasting life. What you have then is a case where the resurrection, guess what, has not occurred in the first century. Now, I'm not able to prove that yet. I'll prove that tomorrow. But let me take a look at a chart again. Take a look, Hannah, if you would get chart 60, uh, well, let's get 74. Give 74 to me. There it is. Did he answer any of this? Did he deal with universalism? I taught you from 1 Corinthians 15, 56 how he affirms it implicitly. He needs to deal with it. Once they go, I say Luke 20, 34 through 36, they can die no more. Did he deal with it? Hardly. His doctrine affirms it. Christ died spiritually. Did he deal with that? No. But he teaches it, and he teaches that one explicitly, incidentally. No passages for future fulfillment. We trust he'll deal with Daniel 2, 44 and 45. Uh, Christ and Paul contradict. He gets up here and he talks about the King James Version. He says, well, the King James Version has many mistakes. Prove it. Prove it. I've given you scholar after scholar who's saying that Paul is right when he says the day of the Lord is not at hand. It's not imminent. And he says, well, Paul spoke of the same thing at different times. He references Romans 13. I wholeheartedly affirm that Romans 13, 11 and 12, deals with the uh, salvation, the physical salvation, from the persecution of Nero. I affirm that Philippians 4, 5 has the same thing in mind as Jeremiah 23, 23. Am I a God that's distant, or am I a God that is at hand? He's a God that is close. Brethren, I don't know what to do with an affirmative speech that doesn't affirm anything. How many minutes do I have, incidentally? Seven minutes. I want to get into a few charts then again that just slay his position. Take a look at my true or false number four. And if you'll get chart, uh, is it 82? 84. 84. What did he do here? He said they're not precisely worded. I don't know how to word these more precisely, but even guess what? Guess what? Even if they're not precisely worded, you have the converse positions here. And then I give the alternative. The only alternative would be that I resurrected at the same time, and he doesn't say any of them. Not a single one of those is true. If this is not true, Steve, you've got to accept this. At best, you can accept this. Any way you cut the cake, he says they're not precisely worded. One of them still has to be the case. And he says none true. None true. None true. Well, let me ask this. When did the resurrection occur? He says 70. Anybody that resurrected before that resurrected in promise. Whoa. Whoa. When did they resurrect? That's what I want to know. When did the first person in sin death resurrect? Because if he was a physically dead person and he came out of sin death, 
please. If he was physically alive and he came out of sin death, you've got to affirm one of these. If you've been alive one that's physically dead and they come out of sin death at the same time, you've got to affirm one of these. He is dodging the argument here. He needs to accept at the least one of the three. He can accept more if he wants, but he's got to accept one of the three. Brethren, he is dodging this argument horribly. Go to my next slide, Hannah. We'll go back to this. The body in 1 Corinthians 15, did he deal with that? I brought up Holger Neubauer, chart 46. Holger Neubauer, chart 47. He says the body is the body of Jews, of Jews, the body of Israel. He says that it's rising simultaneously. It's in process. Did you catch how he didn't even address it? The body of Israel is dying and rising simultaneously. And again, I will quote to you the Apostle Paul who said, Thou fool, how do you quicken something that hasn't yet died? Let's hear how that can take place. We beg him to tell us about that. Come up here, please, Stephen, address 1 Corinthians 15, 36, and tell us how a body, as we prove from charts 46 and 47, can resurrect and die simultaneously when Paul, the apostle, is saying that cannot happen. You will answer that when you come up here. We, we trust that. Go to my next slide here. Then he says that some individuals were resurrected in the 1 Corinthians since before AD 70, and guess what he answers? Neither true nor false. He says, well, uh, in promise, in promise. How do you get more resurrected than the Colossians? Out of sin death, incidentally, in the first Corinthians 15 cents, as he argues, than the Colossians when Paul writes and says, you have been risen with him out of the dead. And guess what? He even says, when you're baptized, let me reiterate this, his very first speech, he says, when you are baptized, you're resurrected. Why not the Colossian saints? Why not the Latin saints of Romans 6, 3 through 7? Or is your argument a farce now? Does he want to crawfish and give up on his very first argument? His only argument I saw that was an affirmative argument in his first speech was if you've been baptized, you've been resurrected, and now he crawfishes and says the Colossians weren't, the Latin saints in Romans 6, 3 through 7 weren't. Who is? How can you trust you are? He's given up on this argumentation. How much time, Billy? 341. 341. I want to get on this prophecy aspect. And I want to talk to you about the prophets, uh, the, the prophetic nature, um, and how it could not all be fulfilled by 70. I mentioned Daniel 2, 44 and 45, but take a look at Zechariah 14 with me. I hold the passage to speak of 70 AD. In Zechariah chapter 14, I hold specifically the passage to speak of the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD. But take a look, and this is Steve's argument. Incidentally, I'm going to get this chart for me. I've got to have this. Uh, take a look at chart 34. 34. He says, Jesus, or let's see, Paul, and this is speaking, it, get the periodical, get the publication, look at the quote. He, and I insert Paul, was looking for fulfillment of all prophecy. And this comes from his uh, article, Then Come at the End, and I believe it's on 1 Corinthians 15. Anyway, he, Paul, was looking for the fulfillment of all prophecy. And he cites Matthew 5, Luke 21. I'm going to go ahead and tell you that Steve Basin holds all prophecies to be fulfilled at least in or by A.D. 70. If I'm misrepresenting you, please correct me. Um, and I want that to be known. If, if I misrepresent, please correct me. I will recant. Anyway, he, Paul was looking for the fulfillment of all prophecy. Read Zechariah 14 with me. And in Zechariah 14, Behold, the day of the Lord comes. That's against Jerusalem in 70. Fighting in the midst of thee. I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. This is when the Romans, and I believe they teach it as well, sacked Jerusalem. Now watch verse 3. Then, after Jerusalem is sacked, that 70, then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations. Who? The Roman army, the Roman state. I want to know how that happened within 70 AD. I'm not asking because I, um, I'm making an argument necessarily, although I think that's implied. But I want to know how that can be the case. How can it be the case that God came against Rome before 70 when this very action would not happen until 70? Do you catch the argument? This, whatever it speaks of, is after 70 A.D. The same thing is taking place in Revelation 20. In verse 7, I don't know what y'all's view is on the thousand-year reign. Max King's view is that the thousand-year reign extended exactly until 70 A.D. But what are we then to make out of Revelation 20, verse 7? And how could it be fulfilled in 70? It says after the thousand years expired. If the thousand years run up to and end in 70 A.D., how could the thing said in Revelation 27, whatever it speaks of, be fulfilled within 70 AD when it says after the thousand year reign is expired? You've got to see that, brethren. You've got to see that he's got Rome falling. I want to know his exposition of Daniel 2, 44 and 45. Did Rome fall? Did it? Was it prophesied in Scripture? If it was, how did it happen before 70? I'll address more on Daniel 2 because I want to get into some of that and I've missed my time. I'm sorry about that. 
But I want to get into Daniel 2 a little bit more in 44 and 45 and show you that Rome was prophesied to fall and it could not happen before 70 AD. Uh, if we've got time, I'll go through right now. Billy, how much time? 38 seconds. Daniel 2 says the kingdom that's established by Christ, that kingdom, is going to destroy Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome. Rome's fall is not until later. How could that be within 70 AD? At best, they've got to say that was not prophesied in Scripture. I've got charts of their own friends, their own colleagues saying that it is. Now, we'll deal with that next time. I've got charts on it. I'll probably present them. But we've got to see how they, expo- uh, they give an exegesis on Daniel 2, 44 and 45. Was it fulfilled by 70 or not? Again, give me a affirmative argument. I'll deal with it if you, sit, if you send me one. Thank you for your time. Attention. You ready, Kurt? Yes, sir. Okay. Billy, you ready? Say when. All right. Number one, Drew, it's not my responsibility. It's not my obligation to follow you. You are in the negative. I'm in the affirmative. You want me to get up there and you answer all your... You need to be answering mine more more than what you have. 
You said I've not made any resurrection or judgment arguments. Every argument I've made, I've illustrated how through that argument, for example, I am the resurrection of life. If Jesus, if we're in Christ, we're in resurrection, resurrection must have come. He says that's physical age, spiritual age. I say it's Mosaic age versus Christian age. He's not really even dealt with that. But his argument on it was this. They shall never die. They have eternal life. He equates that to me being a Calvinist. He says, now you're a Calvinist because you say you can never die again. But the text says they are equal to the angels. In the resurrection, the equal. Drew, answer. What happened to the angels that sinned in the book of 1 Peter? Weren't they cast down? Weren't the angels cast out for sinning? Now, if we're equal to angels, and angels are cast out for sinning, I'm not teaching Calvinism. I'm teaching you've got to be faithful. If you're in, you can fall from grace equally as well. Being in the resurrection is called falling from grace. Galatians 5 4 just proves that real quickly. But let's go through argument number two. I have also illustrated how the Lord must have come back. And when the Lord comes in the judgment and the resurrection, all things will be fulfilled at that time. And through the communion, we've illustrated how the Lord must have come back. We're not talking about coming into the hearts of men. We're not coming talking about coming upon nations in judgment. We are talking about the final coming of Christ, which he says, 1 Corinthians 11 denies, and I say, I turn it right back on, his argument is the one that's messed up. If he's not seeing the equation here, I can't help it. Maybe that's a part of the problem. I don't know exactly what to say about that. He wants to keep talking about, he mentioned Kittles. I can show Kittles in my argumentation that he actually argued for it to be at hand. Uh, Kittles, right there, number five, Theological Dictionary. I quote, in the perfect it means to have entered and therefore be present. Now he can say what he wants, but the truth of the matter is, I can cite a hundred different passages for the at-hand statement of the Nisimai in 2 Thessalonians 2, 2. He can give several, but the point is, Paul was being consistent in his delivery of what he was talking about. He was not contradicting Jesus. He was not contradicting himself. And he says, oh, well, this is about to be something other than that because they were taken away in idolatry. He makes the, uh, an argument on them being carried away in idolatry. Billy, can you pull up Second Thess, uh, Acts chapter 17? No, you can't? I'm sorry. All right. Uh, let me, let me, uh, let, let me, well, I'll come back to that in a minute. I'll, I'll come back to that. But in Acts 17, verses 16 and 17, He's talking about the Jews there being carried away into idolatry. That's what had happened. And even some of the Gentile converts would have been following them into those kind of things. Judgment was coming upon them. If Paul told them that he was going to recompense judgment to relieve them from those who were persecuting them, if he hasn't done it, Paul never kept his promise to the Thessalonians. That church is not even no longer even in existence. He was talking to them. You've got to get audience relevance. You've got to understand the who, what, when, where, and why of, who, of what was being spoken to and about uh, at that time. Now, you want to make an argument about John chapter 5, verse number 25. I, I guess I need to just um, let me bring this, this text up if I can. And... Uh, I thought we had that up where we could pull that up. John 5, 25, he makes an argument how, and he cites me, and he cited me accurately, as far as I can tell, John, that Jesus said, you can pass from death to life even now. You can come to life even now. And so if that's the case, based in, that means that resurrection life must mean something other than that, because they had it then, and wait a second, let's take a look at this. Let's see exactly what this says in John 5, 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, who? The Jews. Where? <laughs> in Palestine. He that heareth my word and believeth on me, uh, on him that sent me, hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation or judgment, but is passed from death to life. Verily I say to you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God. The hour is coming, and now is. Those who will obey the gospel... They can rise from death to life even now, but there's also a future coming for them. That's our past. That was their future. I wonder if he's ever considered Romans chapter 4. He says, how is it? But he says they already had it, but they didn't have it. How is it they had salvation? If I can prove they had it then, 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 then a future one, it does not count. I don't even know exactly how he equates that. But in Romans chapter 4, 
Let's take a look and see what the Apostle Paul said in verse number 17. And as we're turning there, I want to ask a question about Abraham. Abraham was made the father of many nations. And when God told him that, it was before he ever birthed a child. It was before he had gotten into any land, before he came into possession of any land. But God told him at that time, before he even had any children, I have made you a father of many nations. Present tense. I have made you a father. But he wasn't a father of one kid yet. Not one child. Ishmael, Isaac had not even been born yet. How is it he was the father of of, uh, 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 at that time of many nations but he didn't because Romans 4 17 has it as it is written I have made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believed even God who quickeneth the dead now watch this and call those things which be not as if they were that's the already but not yet God can say something Drew I'm telling you that settles it if God says you were saved that settles it but this was given in promise. How do I know that? Because God could speak and call those things as be not as if they were. Let me give you an illustration. On the day of Pentecost, in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, Peter said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. He's going to agree with me. There is salvation. He's going to say they were saved on Pentecost. And I'm going to say, Amen, they were. Why were they still looking for salvation to come? In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 9. Why were they still looking for salvation to come if they had been saved 35 years earlier in Acts chapter 2? The Hebrew writer said, For they that look for him will he return a second time without sin unto salvation. That's because they had it in promise, Drew. They did not have it as a reality. Paul was looking for that salvation to come in their future. When would that take place? At the coming of Jesus Christ. What would happen at the coming of Christ? The dead would rise. Let's go to Revelation chapter 6. I want to show you how that works with Revelation chapter 6. We're going to take a quick peek at this. How much time do I have, Billy? 12 minutes. It's beautiful. Let's take a quick look at this. In verse... Beginning from verse 9 of Revelation chapter 6. When he had opened the fifth seal, I saw him to the altar the souls of them that slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. I don't think he would disagree with me. If I misrepresent you, you please tell me. The fifth seal is open. I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God. These are martyrs. I believe, and I, I can illustrate this by the previous verse, this is from a Hades. They were in the paradise side of Hades. They had been martyred. Right out, verse 10. How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? Number one, I want to ask. If you are already in heaven, and you're, he, he's going to be quick back to the paradise side of Hades, I suppose, why would you want judgment and vengeance to come? What's the problem? You want to see your parents in Jerusalem being coming that's going to destroy the physical earth? You want your friends who are not yet converted to Christianity? Why are they begging for judgment to take place now, here and then? Here's exactly why. Because Hades is separation from God. When you're in Hades, you're not in heaven. When Jesus Christ came back from Hades, he told Mary, touch me not, I have not yet ascended unto the Father. Now, yeah, where did he go, Drew? He went to Hades. Hades is separation from God, which, by the way, proves he was separate. What separates man from God? What separates anything from God? Sin. Your sin has separated you from your God. Jesus was not a sinner, but he bore the sins of every man, woman, and, and any accountable person on the cross. He became a curse for us. He became sin for us. He paid the price we could not pay. He went to Hades, and he had to come out. So why... Why, oh why, were they begging for judgment and the vengeance? Because they wanted to go to heaven. They were separated from him in Hades. Okay, what were they told? They were given white robes and told to wait just a little while here. A little while for what? For the vengeance and the judgment. Well, what did Jesus say? When, now they cried out, oh Lord, how long, holy and truth, that thou not judge and avenge our blood? What did Jesus say about this vengeance, about the blood? Let's just take a look at this. 
verse number 21, uh, excuse me, Luke chapter 21, verse number 20. The Bible says there, when you see, excuse me, let me Jesus said there, when you see Jerusalem compass of armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Same desolation as, uh, as Daniel 12. We're going to get into that. Drop down for, uh, for time's sake, look at verse number 22. Watch it carefully. For these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. They cried out, when's the vengeance coming? Lord, when's it coming? Let me ask, do you believe him? He said, when Jerusalem's compass of armies... That's when the vengeance would come. What would happen? Hades would be judged. They would rise in the resurrection. Those which had done good to the resurrection of life and those which had done evil to the resurrection of damnation. Hades is now judged and that world is no longer there. Listen, the blood of Christ made the atonement in His coming. Hebrews chapter 9. He was shed on the cross, but He had to go into the most holy place for God to accept it and for those that look for Him when He returned a second time without sin unto salvation. That's why they were still looking for it. They had it in promise, just like Romans chapter 4, verse 17 said. Now, He says, I've not made my argument. And He, and he wants to... Uh, what other arguments? I want, to, I want to follow some of these. He talks about 1 Kings 13, 13. And, and there how uh, we say this by the word of the Lord. And listen to me carefully. Paul was not an apostle to the kings. Well, when Paul said that, he was quoting Christ. Christ quoted and said that same thing. We say this unto you by the word of the Lord. We which are alive remain at the coming of the Lord. Do not prevent them which are asleep. He's going to come in the clouds. He's going to come with the trumpet. He's going to come in the glory of the Father with the angels. Where did Jesus say that? Matthew 24, verses 30 to 35. Jesus said, I'm coming in the clouds. I'm coming with the angels. I'm coming in judgment. I'm coming with the trumpet of God to gather together the elect. There's judgment. When will it happen, Lord Jesus? This generation shall not cease to all these things be fulfilled. Paul was teaching the exact same thing of Jesus Christ. Listen, there's not two different Gospels. He wants you to believe there's more than one Gospel. He wants you to believe there's more than one doctrine. Well, I suppose you may even have a different faith going over there. I can't explain all of his ideology, but the Bible has one faith, one Lord, one baptism, and one body. And we're going to get into that in 1 Corinthians 15 in just a few minutes, time, time allowing. Uh, so I've got, let's go to Mellow. Let me go back to my hundredth time I got, Bill. How many? Six minutes, Alright, very good. Let's go to Mellow. Drew Leonard, he wants to use Mellow when it's convenient for him, but when it's not convenient and he wants it to give up the Romans, he, he, he uses it a different way. He equates uh, 28 by his own argumentation, and then he equates that, he says that's talking about inistimai, a different word. He says, Mellow, but Paul says inistimai, it's not going to fly. That two different phrases, two different words, same exact time period in statement though. But he attended the Tri City School of Preaching with the man, the director was Wesley Simons. And did you know their head, the head, their instructor in that school, when I spoke to him in private, and I had it, I had a quote, your instructor at your school, and the director who supports him, here's what he said. When I asked him when, regarding mellow and the infinitive, Alright? As for mellow, when in the present active indicative and with the infinitive, what does it mean, Robert Tate? Greek scholar at the school he graduated from. I, I, I wonder if you disagree with him. You probably didn't when you were a student. Robert Tate, Greek instructor, Tri City, said this. It means something about to happen. Something waiting to happen or in the infinitive, about to be. Like mellow, uh, like mellow, I am about to. His own ins Greek instructor says mellow in the infinitive always means about to. But he wants to make an argument on that, and that wasn't even brought up by me. If he wants to make these arguments, that's okay. We'll meet him with it. But let's just take a quick look at this. Mellow in the indicative, in the indicative all right? Per Robert Tate, his Greek instructor now, because he did set a day in which he's about to judge the world in righteousness. Now he makes the same argument I do on these time statements. 
He uses metal in Matthew chapter 16, verse 27 and 28, and you just saw him do it, and said it means at hand, we have to respect it, it means A.D. 70. Paul says the same thing, and I'll guarantee he'll deny Acts chapter 17, 31, that there was a day in which... <laughs> Is, is that God is about to judge the world. There's the judgment. By his own admission, it is imminent. It is at hand to those in the first century. Paul says in Acts 24, 14, I confess this unto thee, that according to the way which they call uh, a sect, I see all things that are in the law of prophets have been written, having hope toward those also wait for it, that there is about to be a rising again of the dead, both of the righteous and unrighteous. There is about to be. You said you've got to honor that. Your Greek scholar taught you, I suppose, a little bit of the Greek. I wonder if you're going to disagree with your old school. I wonder if you're going to take it back. I wonder how you're going to handle it. I'm going to keep it consistent. That's exactly what Jesus taught. That's what you got up here and said he taught, using metal in the infinitive. Now, he said, I did not make any other affirmative arguments. Let me point out to you exactly what my young, oh, excuse me, I didn't even say young friend. Let no man despise thy youth, okay? Uh, let me show you what I did. I said, if I can establish, and he said, I'm going to give Steve the argument that Jerusalem is the woman that sat on the beast. He said that in his last speech. Thank you, Drew, because he also says when that event took place, everything in Revelation is fulfilled. He says, but I didn't argue that resurrection has taken place. Face it. What Revelation 20 talks about? Resurrection. Judgment. The books are open. It's called the great white scene of judgment when Satan's cast down, right? When the resurrection takes, the, the sea's going to give up her dead. They're going to come out of everywhere. Whoa, 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 whoa. Oh, now, that's supposed to take place in his eyes with Rome, but he's already given me my argument. He surrendered it. It is Jerusalem and all of these things and many others we can go to. Every eye did see them. You better believe it. The dead did rise. Where? From everywhere. The four corners of the earth when the last trumpet would sound. Revelation chapter 11 verse 15 teaches, by the way, where our Lord and Savior was crucified. Revelation chapter 11 verse 8. It's just not going to work. He says, I've not made, uh, thank you, Billy, any other affirmative arguments? I wonder what 2 Thessalonians 2, 2 was. And I guess I never did get to finish that, but I'm going to go back to it right now. Drew wants you to believe that Paul did not teach these things. What? That the day of the Lord was at hand, the same day we're talking about, that he agrees that we're talking about when judgment, the judgment would come, and the resurrection would come, Paul taught it consistently with Peter, with John, with James, with Jesus, with every single congregation he spoke to regarding the coming of the Lord. Yes, sir. It was at hand. Yes, ma'am. And he told those Thessalonians, he said, you wait a little while. You're going you're to receive your recompense. I'm going to repay those who have been causing you tribulation. They were going to be removed from keeping his promise to those Thessalonians even today and the Jews have been already rewarded and he doesn't even make that connection. Um, so we've dealt with metal of the strength of sin. How much time have we got, bud? 55 seconds. 55 seconds. I don't know that I have time for the strength of sin. Let me see. Uh, hit that. Uh, Tyre is not the mother of a beast harlot but the Bible, um, I don't know, I don't remember now off the top of my head what he was meaning by that. So I guess I'm going to stop right now but I want you to stop taking the affirmative, you're in the negative. Let's deal with these things, all right? Just getting up here and saying that the King James will be affirm is a, is, a good, is a good translation. Says uh, that it's a hand, therefore you've got to honor it. Listen, that's not going to apply here. You're going to have to do better than that. You can cite Kittle wrong, as you did, as I illustrated, if you want to. That's not going to apply here either. You've got to deal with these. And by the way, if it was at hand, according to your Matthew 16 argument, Jesus was at hand when he wrote the Thessalonians, just like he was when Jesus uh, Jesus told the Jews in Matthew 16. Um, I'll end it there. Right on time. Uh, I, 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 we're running a little late, but is anybody here running a race? Let's, let's just take a couple minutes. You need you probably a couple minutes to set up, or it's up to you. I'll leave it up to you, Joe. Do you want to get in there and jump in the saddle and go? Or something <laughs> <to> you? <laughs>
And I won't call you Trigger. <laughs> Thank you. 
Okay, let's uh, let's be finding our seats, please. Um, we're going to change the format just a little bit. Drew and I just discussed it, and as long as Drew is okay with it, and I'm okay with it, we're going to be okay with it. <laughs> but uh, for this is my fault. I take full responsibility. I did not schedule things as well as I should have because of the bathroom breaks and because of technical difficulties that have caused us to run over time. We're just going to make three speeches each today and tomorrow. And Sunday we'll pick up the slack for what we were today. Uh, you're totally fine with that, right, Drew? Yeah, so we're both. And it's, the reason being is we've got the ladies who have dinner prepared, and then we have a whole evening scheduled. So this will be the last speech for today's debating. Drew will end it out right now. And now, all the preachers that are here, Rooster, that includes you, brother, all the preachers that are here, must have discredited himself, but he, I'm not going to let him get away with it. Uh, we're going we're gonna to all get together, and we're going to have some pictures taken, and there'll be archived somewhere, someplace, for uh, people to see in the future. So right after this speech, if the preachers would come forward, we'll get some pictures, while the ladies do some final preparation for the meal, and this will be the last speech of today's debating, simply because of scheduling. So I'll, I'll hand it over to Drew. Whenever he's ready. Can I just ask one? I, I know oh, yeah, we're not allowed to, but um, do you get this in written form, or is it just? It's into a book. Huh? He's going to he's going to make this into a book. Oh, okay. Now, are, are the lessons? What are the lessons going to be? The lessons are going to be all from our perspective. That all things have been okay. fulfilled. And Rogers and Gary Burke will be speaking tonight at 7 a.m. Okay. So it's all going to be in a the book then. Uh, not, the main, not, not, not the lectures, but just the debate will be in the, in the book. Okay. Now we have some other things to see. Yeah, we will be recording that to DVD. Oh, DVD, that's what I meant. Are they paper or DVD? That's yeah. my question. Okay. There you Thank go. you. I appreciate that. Sure Sorry. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, go ahead and start my time. Okay, two things I'd like to say, especially. Uh, number one, I cannot say how impressed I am with the kindness on Steve's part. Everybody else here, the hospitality has been great. For that, I'm extremely appreciative. Um, we are striving for unity. I think that's the goal here. For, and the psalmist said how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. And that's what we're striving to have. We're striving to have unity based on biblical truths. Second, Steve says, and I'm getting a little more into my speech now. He says, you've got to do better than, well, let me just say, I'm trying. I'm trying my best. So anyway, uh, with that being said, I still want to see a syllogism that wants the conclusion of chart number six. Pull that up for me, Hannah, if you would. Chart number six says this. Jesus has returned the second time in the first century for the judgment and the resurrection. He is not proving this. He is not giving you an argument that warrants that conclusion undoubtedly. And I'm going to prove he tried to go through it on Babylon, saying that the book of Revelation talks about these things. I'll address that. That doesn't prove it. That does not remotely prove the point. Now, in John 11, 25 and 26, he quotes Christ and says, I, I agree with that. That's not debated. But the problem is he is saying that we are in the age to come. I want to point out to you the serious consequence of affirming such. In John 10, 28 and 29, Billy, if you'll pull that up, John 10, 28 and 29 says exactly the precise amount the person has if he is in the age to come. Watch this. In John 10, 28 and 29, he is saying, uh, okay... Okay, here we go. John 10, 28. I give unto them eternal life, which is in the age to come, Mark 10, verse 30, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. If you have eternal life, and you've got to have it, if you're in the age to come, as they're arguing, if you've been resurrected, as they're arguing, guess what? No man can pluck you out of the Father's hand. 
You were there, you were once saved and always saved. I saw incidentally recently this week, William Bell posted a uh, comment on one of his videos where he says that you can fall from grace. Well, how can that be if no man can fuck you? And furthermore, I'd ask the question, what in the world does the word eternal have to do with it? Is that not a temporal life if you can fall from grace? It's self-contradictory. Bring up 74, Hannah, if you would. Let me point this out again. Basin's prison, and he still has an escape from it. Universalism. It's implied. He doesn't affirm it explicitly. It's implied by his doctrine. 1 Corinthians 15, 56. Romans 4, 15. 1 John 3, 4. Once saved, always saved. We just prove that with John 10, 28, 29. He says you've got eternal life in actuality right now since 70. That is problematic because you cannot then fall from grace. Christ died spiritually. I promise you we'll get into that. We will get into that tomorrow. Uh, no passages for future fulfillment. He still has to address Daniel 2, 44 and 45. It says that the kingdom of Rome is going to fall. Was it fulfilled in 70? Good brethren, you know that's not right. You know that's not right. And then Christ and Paul contradict. We'll come on that here in just a moment. He hasn't escaped that remotely. Now, he brings up the communion until 70. I don't see any problem with that, and I'll just pass over that because I don't see any problem. Uh, I believe that the saints in Acts 20, verse 7, were communing with Christ in the same way that we are in there. Kittles. He brings up Kittles and says, well, Kittles is still speaking on his side of things regarding an estimate. Well, it's funny that he quotes Kittles but forgets the footnote. The footnote specifically on 2 Thessalonians 2, 2. And Kittles actually says that there is an indication of future there. Read the footnote in Kittles' Theological Dictionary of the New Testament. He passed over that. Isn't that significant? Why didn't he read the footnote that says there is future indicated there? And he's trying to get the rendering of past. Has come. He's trying to get Paul to say in 2 Thessalonians 2, 2, the day of the Lord has come, thinking that the day of the Lord has come. That is not what Paul's arguing. That is not remotely so. Now, let's take a look at Acts 17. He says that's talking about the Jews carried into idolatry. Question. What in that context limits, limits Paul's speech to the Jews? Paul says in Acts 17, 30, 17, 31, there's a day coming in which every man everywhere, all men everywhere. Now, if Paul wants to restrict that, let him do it, but he didn't. Paul cannot, per their doctrine, speak on all men. If Paul wanted to speak of a day of judgment that's futuristic for even us today, they won't let him do it. Acts 17, 30, 31, 32, he's trying to do it. He's trying to tell us that there is a singular day of judgment coming unto all men everywhere, and these brethren will not let him say it. They won't let Paul say it if he wanted to. That is problematic. Acts 17, 30. We'll come back on that here in just a moment. Now bring up, uh, Hannah, if you'll bring up my charts, uh, number 25. He goes to John 5, 25 and quotes Christ properly, where Christ says they can resurrect now. Those that have passed from unbelief unto belief have resurrected. Well, you know what? I'm still begging to know. That's not right. 95. Uh, there we go. I'm still wanting to know how Basin can be reconciled with Christ. I'm wanting to know how Paul can be reconciled with Steve. He is saying that him and Philetus, Paul is, they have erred saying that the resurrection is past already. Resurrection's already occurring. That's not right, Paul says. Steve comes along and says, well, our Lord said so. Go back to my chart. Get uh, number 10, Hannah. I have told you before, I told you the first time, this is what he's trying to do. He's trying to equivocate at its finest and get you to believe that there's one kind of resurrection when he needs it. But when he's got Christ saying resurrection has it, if you teach that, then resurrection, you're in error. He's trying to say there are two. Did resurrection occur or not before 70 AD? If not, what do you mean by this statement in uh, chart number 95 when you are saying that they could resurrect now? If they couldn't resurrect... My, my, what do you make out of Colossians 2, 11 through 13? When it says they've risen out of sin death, as you would say. Okay, I think that's problematic. Go to number 86. Look at my question again. Some individuals were resurrected. He says, in promise. In promise. What does he mean in John 5, 25 when he says, well, they can resurrect now? He didn't say in promise then. Why not? Because he's got you guys reading his publication where he is saying, look, you're not thinking about it this way. You're thinking about resurrection from our point of view. There is a sense in which they were resurrected spiritually. And that, like you said, Acts 2, I affirm that. They were fully saved in Acts 2. But then he, bring, he brings up the question, why were they still looking for salvation in 1 Peter 3, 9? Let me read to you from Jim McGuigan, who on these matters I highly respect. 
And Jim McGuigan says in page 71, redemption has more than one aspect. Well, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. Salvation now is real and present, but it isn't exhaustive. Life in this earthly arena is real, but there's more life on the other side. With a sideways glance at earthly Jerusalem, the Hebrew writer said, we have no abiding city here, but we look for one to come. They had no physical city where they dwelt permanently, but they were going to an abiding city. That phase of their living was still to come. Salvation, and he says this, salvation is a rich and complex concept. It has more than one aspect. It's now real and present, but that's not exhaustive. I want to know, I want to know, good brethren, do you believe that you're going to be saved when you die? No? No? You're going to go to, to, to the opposite of being saved? Do you believe you're going to have salvation when you die? And if so, give me a scripture for it. Please. Please do. Because the minute you say you will get saved from whatever it is, corruption, your spirit's going to be saved from eternal separation, if you do from any of that, number one, we need a scripture for it. Number two, you've got, a, uh, you've got an aspect of salvation that is different. Do you see how redemption, salvation, cannot be summed up in just one context, one saying as they're teaching? There are several aspects of salvation. Hebrews 9.28, in my opinion, speaks of the same thing in Romans 8, 18 to 23. I think you'll agree with me on that point. It's not the same in that we're thinking of the same thing. In Romans 8, 18 to 23, I believe that the redemption of the body is the same thing as in mind and, as in Romans 8, uh, Hebrews 9.28, but it's talking about redemption from physical corruption. They do not agree with that. They're going to say that it actually refers to redemption. But he brought up Hebrews 9.28. Let me go ahead and go on to that. In Hebrews 9.28, he says salvation is still looked for. Salvation is still being anticipated. But which salvation is it? Right there. Are we just to think that every salvation in every context is the same? Look at Hebrews 10, good brethren. Look at it with me. Take a look at Hebrews 10, Billy, if you would. And pull up Hebrews 10, uh, verse 10 through 12. They say that the salvation in Hebrews 9, 28, the atonement, the sacrifice, had not yet been completed. But watch what it said in Hebrews 10 and verse 10. When you see the, uh, and they make this motif, let me incidentally read to you from my book, and this is what Don Preston had to say on the matter. He said, simply stated, if the high priest, and Steve made this argument, if the high priest did not come back out of the most holy place, that is awful. And let me tell you why. Number one, because in Hebrews 10, 10, by the which will we are sanctified, there's your salvation, through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Every priest, here, watch it with me. Every priest stands daily ministering. If the, the atonement, the sacrifice, is still continuing until 70, Christ should not be sitting down. He should be standing, still making an atonement. He should still be sacrificing himself. He doesn't do that. Watch this. Offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. In order to indicate the completion of the atonement, it says this man, Christ, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. That indicates the sacrifice is complete. Now, Hannah, if you would get my chart, uh, we've got to see this. Take a look at McGuigan, uh, chart 59. And we will trust that Steve will give us proof for his assertion. He, and McGuigan's writing about Max King, needs to establish rather than assert that the high priest's act of returning from the holiest was an essential part of the ritual of atonement. We've got to catch that they are ignoring the motif in Hebrews 10, 10 through 12, while they're accepting one that's not taught in Scripture. Can you beat that? Good brethren, you've got to notice this. This is not taught, this is asserted. If Christ didn't leave it, that's not taught in the Bible. What is taught in the Bible is that Christ sat down, indicating the completion of atonement. The sacrifice is complete in Acts 2. The sacrifice is complete, and it was complete before 70. Christ sat down to indicate the point. Now with salvation in Hebrews 9.28, well, why were they still looking for it? Because it's talking about redemption from the corruptible body. This is not talking about salvation from past sins. They've already been saved in that way. And he says, well, salvation, they, were, they weren't resurrected. They weren't saved. They weren't fully atoned for until 7. That is awful. That is awful. Incidentally, you've got the apostles teaching all the time, telling people you can be saved. Well, they're not actually saved. Now, he brings up Romans 4. Don't think I'll die. I'll address it. He brings up Romans 4, verse 17. And he says, Abraham, bring that up if you would, Billy. Romans 4, verse 17. Abraham was called father of many nations. He hadn't even given birth yet. Then giving birth to Isaac. But watch this. In Romans chapter 4, verse 17, same kind of thing. I'll give you another passage, and I'm sure you all know. Joshua 6, 2. You've got the city, but they hadn't taken it in actuality. They agree with that. Great. So Romans 4, 17, as it is written, I have made the a father of many nations. And that's talking in prospect, in promise, to quote their own words. Let me make this argument. In Colossians 2, there's nothing to restrict it. 
We've got the atonement completed. Christ has already sat down and they say, well, the salvation there, their baptism, their resurrection hasn't even really been completed until 70. There is nothing in that passage that forces us to restrict it. Billions hermeneutics would teach that you only figureize or you only say something's perspective when forced to conclude it. There is nothing in Colossians chapter 2 to force us to that conclusion. They have been resurrected out of sin and death. They haven't been resurrected in the physical, biological aspect. But they have been resurrected spiritually, and they try to say, well, if only in promise. Why do they say that? Because we would ask, why are the Colossians being resurrected? Colossians 2, 11 through 14. While Paul not in Philippians 3. See, Paul hadn't been resurrected, but somehow the Colossians are saying they have. Incidentally, why wasn't Paul saying, I've been resurrected? And then they say, well, he's saying that in prospect. No, that's not the case. Let's go on a little further then. Uh, okay. He brings up Revelation again. Bring up chart number six. Uh, chart number six, again, his arguments on Revelation don't prove this. You've got to see how his argument on Babylon from Revelation doesn't prove Jesus has returned the second time of the first century for the judgment of the resurrection. Well, there's a coming. Well, there's a coming in Isaiah 19.1. It was in judgment. Well, the books are open. Well, the books are open in, Re in uh, Daniel chapter 7, 9, and 10 at the fall of the fourth beast. Rome. Incidentally, tell me how Daniel 7, uh, 9, and 10 was fulfilled in 70. That can't be. That can't even remotely be the case. Daniel 7, 9, and 10. Those books are at the fall of the fourth beast. That's the judgment of the fourth beast, the text says. If we need to prove that, we can. Uh, take a look then. Incidentally, uh, Luke 21, 22. Bring that up, Billy, if you would. He asserts. He says on Matthew 5, 17 and 18. Well, Paul, Jesus, they were all looking for the fulfillment of all prophecy in 70 AD. I cannot stress this to you enough. He has not addressed Daniel 2, 44 and 45. He did not address my argument on Zechariah 14, 1 through argument on Revelation 20, verse 7. And he continues to assert that this is more than just contextual and actually speaks of every prophecy being fulfilled by or in 70 AD. That is just sheer ignorance of the scriptures. As, I don't mean to say that in your article, by the way. I'm saying it's ignorant in the aspect that you're dodging the arguments that I'm presenting to still promote this as if it's saying all things are fulfilled in 70. Please answer my argument on Daniel 2, 44 and 45. Please answer my argument on Revelation 20, verse 7. Please answer my argument on Zechariah 14. And until you do, these good brethren are going to notice you dodge. They're going to notice that not all prophecy was fulfilled in Zechariah 14, uh, or by 70. They're going to notice these things. These brethren are watching. Now take a look then on 1 Thessalonians 4, 15. Uh, Billy, if you've got that. Incidentally, how much time do I have? Five minutes. Good night. Uh, yeah, 1 Thessalonians uh, 4.15. And the, way, the reason I'm saying that his argument on Babylon not fulfilling his proposition is because Foy Wallace held that same view that Babylon is Jerusalem. And all of those things he even said, and I read it to you in my former study, that is not talking about the second coming. It's not talking about the final of resurrection from the dead. Now, are you going to take Foy Wallace or are you going to disagree with him? I don't care if you disagree with Foy Wallace or not. Even on his view of the Revelation, I disagree with him. But my point is, just by seeing the books, the comings, the resurrections in Revelation, does not comment on the final aspect of things. Now deal with that. Now we take a look at 1 Thessalonians 4.15. Go back up a little bit, Billy, if you would. Verse 15 says, he says this by the word of the Lord. He says, Apostle Paul was an apostle to the king. That dodges the argument so poorly that I'm here to say, guess what? The 1 Kings 13 passage still illustrates that the phrase by the word of the Lord is not exclusively limited to the words that Christ said, which he's asserting on 1 Thessalonians 4.15. We need proof for that. We haven't seen proof that that means that the Lord said it. If so, let's have the answer on 1 Kings 13. Now, I believe you misunderstood me on Melo. On Matthew 16, 27, 28, I'm not making the argument that that indicates imminence there. I'm not trying to say that. I'm saying that your position says that. And to illustrate such, let me prove what I mean by that. And see chart 49. Ham, if you've got chart 49. I believe it indicates imminence at times, but I'm not saying that it means that across the board. That's not bad, is it? Anyway, in 49, here's the impression on that. The fact is that the primary meaning of mellow with the infinitive is about to be on the, be on the point of. I'm trying to represent you correctly by saying mellow in your position with the infinitive means eminence every time. I don't hold that view. And to prove such, bring up, Hannah, if you would, um, chart 57. Here's Jim McGuigan on mellow. In 813, joined to an infinitive, and he's speaking of Romans, I believe, Melete, the from the root mellow, so then, if you live after the flesh, you will shortly die. In Romans 4.24, again, joined to an infinitive, melee doesn't mean about to be or shortly to be reckoned. The stress is certainty and not nearness. 
In Galatians 3.23, it's used with an heiress infinitive and stresses the certainty of the revelation of the faith rather than the nearness the period covered is from Moses to Christ. Of it, take a look at our next chart. Our next chart, Mello, uh, Jim McGreen goes on. Acts 26.22 gives us another illustration of its use with a present infinitive. Very sure. What the prophet said should certainty stress come, not what people like Moses, Isaiah, and Joel said was about to pass. There are those who build major doctrines on explicit claims that mellow always means nearness of fulfillment. The data is very clear on the matter. Check for yourself that this isn't true. Now what are we going to do with that? Take a look at my next chart. Hannah, go on. Uh, no, go to 62. Here's Curtis Cates. Curtis Cates, number 62. Look at this. Malachi prophesied, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and terrible day of Jehovah come. Malachi 4, 5. Jesus referred to this prophecy in Matthew 11, 14. If you are willing to receive this, this is Elijah. That is to come. Mellow. There's your root. Would you believe that 400 years were covered by the word mellow here? Would you believe that mellow used twice in Acts 26, 22, 23 covers 1,500 years? The time necessary to fulfill what the prophets of Moses did say should come? Mellow again. Take a look at our next chart, Hannah. Curtis takes part two. Well, would you believe 2,500 years? That should actually be 4,500, incidentally. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam until Moses, even after them that had not sinned after the likeness of Adam's transgression, who is a figure of him, Christ, that was to come. Melantos. Do you see how that shatters their view on Melo? They argue that Melo, with the infinitive, is always indicating imminence. That's not remotely the case, Robert Tate. I never even listened to Robert Tate talk about Melo. So pardon me, I, maybe I skipped class that day. I never heard Robert Tate speak on the word mellow. And even if he did, I'm not saying I agree with it. You need to quote me rather than a teacher of mine who I may disagree with. One minute? Okay. I talked about Fort Wallace. He brings up the book. Daniel 7, I talked about that. Bayesian continues to go on and on and on about Revelation. Look, I'll grant him his position if he wants it, like I said, that Babylon is Jerusalem. He still hasn't proved, especially in light of what Fort Wallace has said, that that proves that the second coming of Christ the final judgment, the final resurrection has come. My commentary, if you'll buy it back there, I'm trying to sell books incidentally, will, tell, will show you how these things are not exclusively limited. These same kind of things were spoken of by the prophets. These same kind of things were spoken of by the fall of nations before. We're not going to take the assertion anymore, nor are we going to take a dodging of giving us an affirmative argument to prove that the second coming has been fulfilled, that the, that the resurrection of the dead has come. I've got to stop. I appreciate you listening to me. That's okay. We're, we don't, um, I don't want to get into any two hour thing or you know, even an hour thing here, but we do want to open it up for some Q&A from the audience. If you have questions for Drew, he's welcoming them, he wants them. If you have questions for me, I feel the same. Uh, let's just take a few minutes and we'll fill a few questions and then we'll break for lunch. Um, but it, I want to limit it, I mean, I don't want to slight anybody, I'm sure everybody has a thought or a question, but we just can't take everybody's thoughts, everybody's questions, so let's limit it to, let's say, 15 minutes, five after five. All right, so if anybody has any questions, then uh, let's just start by raising hands and ask who your question is addressed to, and that individual then can go from there. Are there anyone with any questions? We've got two. I think Kyle beat you, Daniel. Go ahead, Kyle. Uh, my question is, is for Drew, and it's simply if he could... Okay, here, about it this way. We'll get this on tape that way. Check, test. Okay, my question is for Drew, and it's simply, could you please articulate for me and for, I guess, everybody else, what your position is of dual or multiple fulfillments of prophecy. Excellent, excellent. That is a good question. I think we've done poorly in that regard as far as the brotherhood is concerned. I firmly believe that several prophecies, of the Old Testament specifically, are fulfilled at multiple times. Uh, I think, I, honestly, and this gets me into trouble, who knows who. I think that Isaiah 7 14 is one of those. I think that there is an application very much with Ahaz and the time. But somehow we've got to look at it as receiving a second application because of Matthew 1, 22, and 23. I think the same kind of thing is being done in Hosea 11, 1, as seen in Matthew chapter 2 and verse 15. If you'll take a look at my Zechariah book, I've got an appendix in there on fulfillment of prophecy, dual fulfillment. And let me suggest this. Dual fulfillment of prophecy is only to be seen when the Holy Spirit leads us that way. 
If the Holy Spirit doesn't tell us to see it as a dual prophecy, we are not to see it that way. When the Holy Spirit tells us, though, then it was fulfilled, and we're looking at a prophecy that's already been fulfilled to some degree, we've got to say it's got a double meaning. For instance, Hosea 11.1, 1, when, when Israel was in Egypt, I called my son. No reference to the Christ as I see it in Hosea 11.1. 1. But when Matthew 2.15 gives it an application and says this spake of the Christ, we've got to look at it as both. Once in Egypt, once in Christ. Can we rebut that? Um, sure. I mean, yeah. I'm only going to say that there's only one fulfillment. Not dual fulfillments. There's one time given for a specific fulfillment, not two. One set of events, not two. One set of characters, not two. And there's only one. It's called type and anti-type. What was written before, they would do things physically that would represent a reality in their future. And I'll leave it at that for now, just because of the time I want to get in some more questions. If that's all right. Great. And if you want to bring that up, we can... In the next uh, Sunday, when yeah. we do the recap, yeah. uh, is that uh, Daniel is next? Uh, Daniel here. I thought I'd come to you to get the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I got two questions. One's just a quick yes or no to clarify, and okay. the other is to follow up. Uh, do you take Matthew 16, 27, and 28 to be 80, 70? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Okay. Can I read that for him? Yes. Yes. Right. Go ahead. Matthew 16, 27 and 28 says, For the Son of Man is going to come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and will then repay every man according to his deeds. Truly I say to you, there are some of those who are standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Uh, how do you define every man in Matthew 16, 27? The same way that I would define it in Revelation 1, 7 with the every eye, or the same way I would define it in Revelation 22, 12 with reward of every man according to his works. As you know, I emphatically state that the book of Revelation, in my estimation, refers to the Roman fall. I believe that Revelation 22.12, a passage which sounds very similar, has reference to the fall of Rome. And I believe that the context limits it, um, unlike I would believe Acts 17.30, which you guys know, you just heard my last speech. I believe it is not as broad as Acts 17. So when you see Matthew 16, 27, 28, I think that it is contextually limited to the judgment that was discussed specifically on the fall of Jerusalem in 87. Yeah. All right. Any other? Any other? Hello. You got a question? Why you respond? You you have people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You take. Yeah, if you want to respond, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I, I was just going to let it go and, and look at it a little bit later. Uh, in fact, I, I was daydreaming. I didn't hear what he said to me. I was like, "Oh, he affirmed Matthew 16, 27, 28. Oh, okay. yeah. Right. Revelation one seven. He says the destruction of Rome in every eye. So he's got Jerusalem falling in right. Matthew sixteen twenty seven twenty eight. Right. Look at Rome falling in some kind of way into each. You know, it's, my quick response off the top of my head is this: Everything's got to harmonize. Right. You must respect the immediate context along with remote context as well. You mentioned Colossians 2 earlier that there's no general or wide or uh, other relation to this, but it must harmonize that same thing with every other verse in Scripture talking about that same thing. So I'm going to I'm going to put it at that right now. So Matthew 26, 27, and 28, everyone's going to be judged at that time. Is is John 5? This is Daniel 12? It's Revelation 1? It's Revelation 22? One final fulfillment for those things, and, uh, and at that time is. As you've said, uh, uh, Judas, uh, I was, I'm a little bit confused on, maybe on your position, maybe I didn't hear right. I just, I just want to confirm, do you believe that Matthew 16, Matthew 24, 30, and Revelation 1 and 7 are the same event? No, I don't. No, Holder's exactly right. Shaking his head. No. No, I hold Revelation 1 7 to be about the Roman fall, uh, whereas I hold the other two to be about the 70 AD fall of Jerusalem. Okay, and he... Uh, I wouldn't necessarily put a number on it as much as I would say I think it refers to the Domitian fall. So he, uh, the question was, do you think, when, when did Rome fall? And he says during the reign of Domitian. Okay. Uh, oh, hold on, no, 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 don't, mis don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying Rome was an empire fell. I'm saying I think that's a, Rome, a Revelation 1 7 refers to the fall of Domitian's empire specifically. Okay. Not so the whole Roman empire, but specifically Domitian as an empire. Okay. And see, 
in, in, in what we had done earlier, what he said was he gave me that it wasn't Rome, it was Jerusalem. He said, I'm going to give him that. And that's exact. And if he wants to go back to the woman that sat on the beast, that was Babylon. And I'm going to rest my argument right there. And whether Boy Wallace believed that or not, you know what? Boy Wallace is a human. He made mistakes. And he, he made the same mistake Drew made because he, get to, he got to Revelation 20. He could not contemplate how Satan was cast, cast down, how the thousand years had happened. Be more than happy to get into all of that, uh, but we just need the proper uh, time frame to do that. We got a bunch of questions. I got Sean Farrell and Robert Bunya. We got we got several more minutes. Let me give this to Sean. So, so Drew, although I have a lot of questions for you, yes, sir. You keep getting questions, so I'm gonna give you a chance to rebut Steve here. Okay. So, uh, Steve, there's some passages in Daniel that Drew's mentioned that pretty pretty clearly refer to Rome, Absolutely. in most people's opinion. Sure. Do you answer that with an already but not yet, or what? what is, do you have a consistent view of those passages in yeah. Daniel? Okay, I think that's an excellent question, and I did not get into that because I just didn't feel we had the time, I was in the, affirm I was in the affirmative, he was making an affirmative there, when he gets into that, I was going to deal with that, but Daniel 2, since you brought it up right now, in verses 44 and 45, is talking about the destruction of Rome, Make no mistakes about it. The end of Rome as dominating over God's people. That's the idea. I'll leave that there for now. And uh, that would take place.